By the late 2000s, the horror genre had gone to some dark and gruelling places. In America, Hostel. In the UK, Eden Lake. In Australia, Wolf Creek. All of these movies were pushing audiences to their very limit in terms of how much violence, blood and gore they could take. But in 2008, nothing could have prepared audiences for what they were about to bear witness to. <laughs> French director Pascal Logier made a film that felt like a response to the torture porn craze of the 2000s. <laughs> This movie wasn't simply about torture, it was about the after effects of torture. This film was as much interested in the mind and the soul as it was the body, and as a result, it was a far more effective movie than any of its contemporaries, and it remains, to this day, pretty much the most gruelling and upsetting film I have ever sat through. Join me as we continue our journey through the mind and body, and we discuss Pascal Logier's Martyrs. Welcome back to the evolution of horror. My name is Mike, and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. You're really throwing yourself in the deep end this week. Uh, in this podcast, we usually explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. We are currently in the middle of our sixth series, which explores a mix of psychological and body horror, which we are calling Mind and Body. And this is part part 24, in which, as that intro suggested, we are going to be discussing one film and one film only, pretty much the most gruelling and disturbing movie I have ever sat through, and I've sat through quite a lot of gruelling, disturbing movies these last few months, Martyrs from 2008. Happy New Year, everybody. This will be a spoilerific discussion of the film. However, our discussion of the film won't take place until later on in this episode, because we've got a big bumper-sized episode for you guys this week. Later on, in about an hour's time, I will be joined by Stacey Ponder, co-host of one of my favourite podcasts, Gay Lords of Darkness, and she will be discussing Martyrs with me in nitty gritty spoilerific detail but before that we've got a very special interview for you uh, i sat down and had a little chat with another co-host of another one of my favorite podcasts uh, alex west from faculty of horror now faculty of horror for anyone out there who doesn't know if you're if you're a fan of this podcast you will definitely be a fan of their podcast uh, alex west and her co-host andrea supersati they discuss horror movies every month from a kind of analytical and feminist perspective uh, and as well as co-hosting that podcast, Alex also has written an incredible book called Films of the New French Extremity, Visceral Horror and National Identity. So I thought this would be a great time for me to play you the discussion I had with her. Before we get into Martyrs, let's have a little brief history lesson and learn a little bit about this incredible movement of the horror genre called New French Extremity, a movement that ran roughly for sort of 10 years and included within it films like Inside and Trouble Every Day, which of course we discussed last episode, as well as movies like Irreversible, Frontiers, High Tension, and of course, Martyrs. So I sat down with Alex West and we had a spoiler-free discussion in which we discussed the tropes of New French Extremity, the origins, and the legacy that it left behind. Here is my discussion with the brilliant Alex West. <laughs> Hello, Alex. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, not bad, thank you. Yeah, you know, surviving. What about you? You know, uh, just trying to take everything day by day. Um, yeah. The world is crazy. Uh, the events within this world are crazy. And it's a very strange time, but I think it's a good time to uh, bring conversation to horror and expand the conversation in the horror community because we deal with this stuff in our entertainment quite a bit. So first of all, let me ask you, I mean, I, I'm sure most people listening to this will probably be aware of your podcast, The Faculty of Horror. I am a huge fan of it. Um, it's 
essentially the reason that I started my podcast. You guys really inspired me. So thank you so much, first of all, for everything that you do. Um, but please just tell me a little bit about the podcast, if there is anyone out there listening that ha hasn't heard The Faculty of Horror. Sure. So The Faculty of Horror was started by myself and Andrea Subasati, who is now the uh, executive editor of Room Org. Uh, but we started it well before she was that. And mm. uh, we started it back in 2012. So we've been doing it for about seven and a half years. And it's, uh, it's a way for us to discuss horror from um, an academic perspective. We both did our master's degrees in other things. I did mine in theater. She did hers in sociology. But we wound up writing our final papers on horror films. We somehow kind of figured this out. And we did this completely separately before we knew each other. And then as we got to know each other here in Toronto, Canada, uh, we became friends. And I was really getting into podcasts. And we thought, like, why not give this a shot? And it's kind of turned into um, a really amazing community. And we always just try to tackle things from not only an analytical Political point of view, but um, a progressive feminist uh, lens as well, and explore the different topics, the things that are happening in horror uh, from a really accessible way. So it's not like we're just going to talk about uh, Derrida. We're going to like break down Derrida and have an actual conversation about it. So it's not so ivory tower. There's there's a bridge to the tower that you can get to, hopefully. So we're here ready to talk about um, New French Extremity, this incredible movement um, from sort of 10, 20 years ago. And obviously, I wanted to chat to you about it because you are you are the person to speak to about this particular movement. I mean, you've written the, the book, Films of the New French Extremity. Um, before we get into the topic itself, let me ask you a little bit, of, I suppose, about your personal relationship what? with this subgenre. What was it about this subgenre that kind of captured your imagination and what led you to want to write a book about it? So it was really a number of things that kind of crystallized um, probably around 2010, 2011. Uh, I'd seen High Tension uh, when it shortly after it came out, probably 2004, 2005. Mm. Um, and I think the uh, the twist ending kind of threw me a bit. And I, and I always just kind of put that movie to the side a little bit. Um, and then I got recommended uh, the movie Martyrs. Uh, you know, in 2010 or 2011, and I put it on, and it was like I kind of remember my life before Martyrs, yes, and then I think of my life after Martyrs, yeah. Uh, and I went back to this really cool indie video store, which is still around here in Toronto, called Eyesore Cinema, and uh, I went back to return the DVD the next week, and I said, "What? What's the next one?" and he was like, all right, well, here's inside. And so I went and it was a kind of similar process with that one. And um, I grew up in a household. Uh, well, I was, you know, uh, my father's British. And I've always loved the saying that there's nothing more British than a British man outside of his home country. Um, <laughs> so I grew up with the BBC World News report on all the time. All the right. time. Right. Nice. And, um, and so there was a much more Eurocentric uh, version of the news. And so I remember hearing about the Paris riots, hearing about Sarkozy, hearing about all these things. And at the time, I remember thinking like, I thought Paris was like, super nice and really lovely. Uh, and I also I didn't really investigate that. And then after I saw Martyrs, after I saw Inside, and I kind of started researching like, oh, it's part of this whole movement of films. And then it also kind of crystallized with a lot of the uh, news I, I'd been hearing coming out of France um, and a lot of the uh, anger that seemed to exist there. And, and it kind of all seemed to crystallize a little bit more. And that's when I, I started investigating. I started putting it a bit together in my mind. And I, I kind of, I always think as an author, you're looking for a narrative. You're looking to find that story to tell. Um, and that to me was it. it. You know, these incredibly visceral, violent films are rooted in the deeply French nature of them. And so I set out to explore what the French nature is or was. Yeah, it's 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 really fascinating, and it is, I suppose, actually quite a short, condensed period. Like I think you even mentioned in your book, you know, that it kind of burnt bright uh, just for that sort of short amount of time. I guess that's so often the case with these kind of real booms, these movements, whether it's again, you know, going back to the slashers or whatever it might be. Um, let's first of all start with the basics. Then let me ask you, what is New French Extremity? So New French Extremity is a movement that, for me, kind of starts in the late nineties and. And last for about 
10 ish years. Yeah. And uh, it was a term coined by the film critic James Quant uh, in Film Quarterly magazine. And he wrote this whole piece basically deriding it, just saying it's like, it's about sperm, it's about flesh, it's about this, and it's all kind of gross, and I don't like it. Uh, and he's referring <laughs> to the kind of first movement of these films, which for me is the art house movement. So it's films mm. by uh, Catherine Berlay and uh, Gaspar Noé and uh, people like that, Marina Devan. Um, and, uh, and then it was like a lot of, a certain amount of film critics kind of drop it at that point, around like after irreversible and and after a couple there and for me it just picked up so much in the horror genre like horror proper and it kind of really kicks off with alex aja's high tension uh and moves through you know films like frontiers and martyrs and inside uh so that to me was kind of this really pure look at the french psyche uh, through a way that isn't always necessarily explored. Uh, totally, yeah. And, you know, the French, they do have this kind of really interesting history with horror and the macabre. You know, briefly, I'd love to just ask you a little bit about some stuff that you talk about in your book. You know, going back even before cinema, um, things like Theatre of the Grand Guignol and, uh, you know, Artaud's Theatre of Cruelty and that kind of thing. Tell me a little bit about that and kind of what that kind of introduced, I suppose, in terms of horror to sort of French art. So uh, it's so interesting when you kind of, when people start saying like, why horror? Why this? And it's, yeah. you know, humanity has always had a fascination with the entertainment of violence and horror. Uh, certainly mm. for the French. I mean, you think of the guillotines or uh, yeah. the witch burnings uh, across Europe. Um, and But the French in particular have something quite twisted about themselves you know there's the Marquis de Sade uh, there's the Grand Guignol Theatre and you know for the Marquis de Sade he was writing some of the most explicit shocking material he could and um, it it's quite a read if you haven't done it. <laughs> yeah. um, and then the Grand Guignol Theatre kind of came about at the turn of the 20th century. And it featured plays that were uh, incredibly violent, that took place in mental asylums that dealt with like sexuality all the way to incest and, and mm. dealt with these really like lewd things. And they packed houses, packed houses. Um and then it, it all kind of started to die out for the Grand Guignol Theatre um, in the 1960s. And a lot of people attribute that to, to the uh, horrific things that happened within France during World War II, uh, collaborating, you know, not only being occupied by the Nazis, but the Vichy regime, you know, collaborating with them in the way that they did. Uh, so there was a kind of sense of like, oh, we don't, we don't want to deal with this. We want to be like this cool new modern country. Um, and, and I think often people forget that like the city of Paris, like you can go down and it's the catacombs. Oh my God. And you yeah. can just walk around all of these, like the bodies of people and it's a tourist attraction. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it's all of these, seemingly disparate elements, which I think added up to uh, this explosion of violent cinema, because for a lot of people, a lot of, you know, French uh, creators, they wanted to deal with the new wave, they were dealing with politics, they were dealing with love, they were dealing with the youth movement, but they weren't dealing with the violence, particularly as it affected uh, minority communities. And I think a lot of these films really attempt to, if not directly tackle it. It's really interesting as well that I think France has that reputation or as kind of quite obviously an incredibly cultured nation. And I think French cinema often has this kind of reputation, you know, I don't know, you think of you you think of maybe New Wave or Jean-Luc Godard or, you know, again, this quite highbrow cinema, art house a lot of the time. And it seems to me something that you talk about quite a lot in your book with New French Extremity, that there does seem to be this crossover, doesn't there, between French horror and art house? Yes. Yeah. And, and I think there's at some point when you when you kind of deal in art house, it's 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 always such a tricky thing, no matter what country you're kind of in and you're, what you know cinema you're talking about. But if it's independent, if it's arty, if it's quote unquote high minded, there's a certain expectation around it. Yeah. And there isn't the expectation that it deals with explicit sex, that it deals with explicit violence. Those things are too taboo and too weird to kind of house within this art house movement. And I think, you know, the French filmmakers who tackled this through the art 
Krauss movement were uh, in some ways being agitators, which is great. We need that. Uh, and in some ways, they just they couldn't ignore this. Um, they couldn't ignore this visceral humanity that was bubbling under the surface that they wanted to tackle, that they felt they had to tackle. Um, and I think all, all these films kind of do it in really different shocking ways definitely uh, we've been looking um, at some of the sort of earlier french um, horror films from the 50s and 60s um, specifically les diaboliques and uh, also eyes without a face these two fascinating movies um i just wondered you know do you think that because you you've mentioned them a couple of times in your book as well do you think that some of those older movies from the 20th century did in some way kind of add to the evolution of this subgenre of new French extremity? Were they in some way inspiring what would come after, do you think? I, I've thought a lot about that. And I, I'm not sure if you can see the direct correlation from, you know, Les Le Diaboliques or Eyes Without a Face to High Tension, let's say. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Like, I, I'm not sure if Alex Aja would actually say, yes, I watched those films and they filtered mm -hmm. in somehow. But I think thematically, I think um, definitely some of the more shocking scenes of those films, it's you yeah. can see the DNA. And so mm -hmm. it may not be the auteur themselves saying, yes, this, this, impacted me in some way uh, because a lot of those directors the kind of horror new french extremity directors um, have said the biggest inspirations to us were uh, american horror films yes and and great like you can definitely see that but i always think of that scene in eyes without a face which is such a beautiful lyrical movie that deals with this like really really horrific act and it seems for me it kind of culminates when you actually kind of see the the effect of the skin being taken off and you're oh like my oh my god you you don't expect the film to show you that and then you're yeah. watching it happen and it's very simple like the effects are not it's not k and b effects doing it it's not you know explosions it's this simple thing and it is so effective and chilling mm. and it's a simple moment and i think it just kind of um amplifies so much of the messaging of that film so totally and i think there's something in it as well where you, you it's so beautifully shot and it's like this kind of fairy tale or something and then there are these moments of shocking violence and that is something that i think we see in this movement new french extremity isn't it again this kind of you think you're maybe watching some gorgeous high art film for the bulk of eyes without a face and then suddenly <laughs> you see somebody with their face being cut off and it is you know there's some really there's an interesting kind of mix of genres there and styles and everything else i suppose yeah it's I I think, you know, the French, you know, the French, they, they <laughs> love to shock. They yeah. love drama. They love like the theatrical nature of getting um, a rise out of people, I, I, I often think. Um, and they want that that kind of theatricality. And I, and I think a lot of these films do play with that. It's like, we're going to hold back, we're going to hold back. And then, oh my God, here, here it is. Here it is, exactly. Um, so you mentioned the kind of earlier phase where you've got movies from people like Claire Denis and Gaspar Noé. Do you consider those horror films still like would you kind of still recommend those to horror fans those types of movies like for instance trouble every day and irreversible so um i definitely consider trouble every day a horror film mm. um I, I i've seen some people other people refer to it as a horror film um for irreversible i kind of i would put that in the rape revenge kind of category yeah um it's it's such a tricky one to kind of put somewhere um and i and i think a lot of gaspar noe's films kind of defy that labeling and with purpose yeah. um but i always say because a lot of people ask me like what's the most fucked up movie you've ever seen and <laughs> that's it's just a weird question to to get yeah. and i've always said that the film that has upset me the most but that i thought was really brilliant and it, it it played out as intended to me was uh, Bruno Dumas' 29 Palms, mm. um, which is just it, the ending, like the ending. I feel like it just changed me. There was something in it and it just, it was like it, I had to like white knuckle it through that <laughs> film. And it, what's funny is the uh, James Quant article that names that, kind of coined the term new french extremity actually spoils the end of that film so i knew what was going to happen but actually watching it just upset me at such a deep level i'm like i can't watch that again um and you know i've always said to people like that that to me that's that's the 
line that if you want to walk up to it and you can see if you can cross it, go for it. Yeah. But I, I think a lot of these films are kind of playing with uh, various horror elements and recontextualizing them in different ways. So it's um, mm. it, it's definitely, I, I feel like if you are a horror fan and you feel like you've seen it all, then maybe check out some of these other ones because they might kind of expand you're thinking on what you've seen or haven't seen i would say so and they are they are shocking some of them and they are hard to watch i mean irreversible whether or not you'd call it a traditional horror film it's like an it's like a nightmare isn't it it's like a hell it's like you're in hell for 90 minutes or something how did you find just the experience of writing this book and going to these dark places and watching these films and studying these films it must have been quite exhausting at times yeah it was not easy it was not the easiest yeah. um, assignment I have ever given myself. Uh, and it was very weird because I kind of took um, the bulk of the writing um, and rewatching of these films uh, over the spring to early fall months. So it was like, I just kind of like lock myself in my bedroom and just write every weekend and, you know, use all my days off to write for my day job. And uh, I was like, oh, these beautiful, like, summer days with birds chirping. And I was like, and then in 29 Palms, this happens. <laughs> and this is why it happens. And this is why it's, like, affecting the state of France. Um, but it was, it, it was always, I found writing this book in particular, it was like I had to work myself up to sit down and like yeah. start writing it. But once I was there writing it, I was really there. I felt yes. very present in it. So, yeah. Um, are you good in general with, do you find that you've, you've been drawn to the more extreme ends of cinema? Are you somebody that w- wanted to go and seek out, for example, Cannibal Holocaust or Salo, or all of those movies that have those kind of reputations? Yeah, it's, it's, it, oh God, I, I it's always, you know, with that thing when someone says, you can't handle it. And I'm like, yeah. I will show you what I can or cannot handle. <laughs> yeah. So I, you can't, it's it's that, I feel like that with horror fans, we, we have this morbid curiosity when someone says, this is the scariest film ever. You're like, totally. All right. Let's do yeah. it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. There is that absolute morbid curiosity. You've, you've, you've got to tick them off, haven't you? You've got yeah. to see some of these at least once, definitely. Yeah. Um, do you think there's a connection as well? I mean, you talked about how a lot of these filmmakers were influenced by American horror. Do you think there is a link between New French Extremity and body horror? I suppose body horror in the more traditional sense, like the movies of Cronenberg. Yeah, I, I brought up Cronenberg a little bit in the book, um, and I I think Cronenberg is such a fascinating filmmaker, mm. um, particularly from a Canadian perspective. Um, I, I think there's so much of the Canadian film institution, like institution air quotes, that yes. doesn't want to acknowledge him at all. And then it's so many of his films are some of our most popular exports. Um, and, and I think there is, again, that in a different way from France, he's kind of always like shown the body as something pliable, as something malleable, as something Mm. that can be altered with consent or without. And it's such, he creates such interesting tension within his films. And so I kind of see that being parlayed into uh, particularly a film like In My Skin uh, by Marina Devan, also a bit like In Trouble Every Day. And uh, these films about these, you know, quote unquote, desirable bodies, these healthy bodies that are meant to contribute to society. And then what happens when you seemingly willingly start to rip them apart? Yeah. Why is that shocking? How does that affect us? How does that affect the people around these characters? Mm -hmm. And it's, I think there's so much restraint in those films emotionally, even though it's often showing like flesh crawling and peeling, but there's this emotional restraint within them, which I always think kind of plays at odds and, and often gives a bit of weight to um, the Artodian theory that I brought up in the book, which is theater of cruelty. And uh, for Artod, I mean, it was his treaties that he never really got to explore. It's, it's in his book, Theater and It's Double. Um, and as I was mentioning on, you know, my undergraduate and my master's degree are all in theater. So I wound up studying him quite a bit. And, you know, he talks about all these different types of theater and then there's theater of cruelty. And really it's about stripping away this facade 
of nicety um, mm. and, you know, creating theater for him that didn't have a moral outcome because so much of theater, as he was writing in the 20s and 30s, uh, and well before that, had to do with like, if a bad character is bad, they get punished at the end of the film. If good characters are good, they get married at the end. Um, and he just wanted to explode all of that and just say like, fuck it, like, and really create something that was much more ritualistic, much more um, intentional in many ways that had a moral ambiguity to it. So people could actually go and not check out. They actually have to engage at some point, because I think that's always the balance with our entertainment. Is it something that, yes, I can, you know, put on this episode of The Office I've seen 10 times before, and that helps me turn off my brain. Or do I need to actually engage with something? And do I need to actually explore the deeper part of humanity and learn something about myself and the world through this film? Um, and I think that's always kind of what he's playing with. And, and that's, to me, what these films often bring about, whether it's body horror that explores what happens when we harm ourselves and harm others through that harm. And um, I, I think these films really attempt to delve into those ideas it's interesting as well because um i remember this was around the time when i started kind of discovering a lot of international cinema because it felt as though american horror had reached a bit of a dead zone in the sort of beginning of the 21st century and of course you talk about this in your book you know we'd that wave of 90s slashes had kind of ended and we were in a bit of a kind of in-between phase and there was brilliant stuff going on in asia and japan and then there was this movement in France as well. And I just wondered, you know, this is a big question, really, but what was happening in France? What was happening in the world for this movement to kind of ignite, really, I suppose, sort of culturally and socially? I think there is, for me, one of the big differences is the difference between a kind of cinema as culture in France, cinema as um, often independent mm. uh, from a lot of kind of corporatization, whereas in the States, it's, you know, the Transformers films are funded by, I don't know, Pepsi. <laughs> yeah. they like They're going to get all their money from somewhere. And so I always just thought like, Yes, we were seeing like what would become torture porn, but in France, there was something, they were seeing these politics around them. And there were mm. these horrible politics going on in the United States as well, post 9-11. And there's a lot of people making those arguments about 9-11 being linked to torture porn, but I actually find those films are just like, they're violent films. They're yes. violent films and there are things to explore there and that's great. I'm more interested in films that are about violence. And I often think what these films, the new French extremity films, whether they're the art house or the pure horror, as I've called them, yeah. um, they deal, they show violence, but then you see the after effects of it. You see the way it affects different people, the way it affects situations, the way it, like it ultimately changes the world around these characters. Mm. Um, and they feel so much more human to me. Um, you know, I, I think there's, you know, a lot of different things that are going on in the torture porn films, but in New French Extremity, there is a world, there is a world being changed, there is a world being altered, and we don't often get to see that. And these films yeah. don't always offer a clear cut, and that's why this new world is good. It's like, here's this new world, now you have to go make something of it. Yeah. Absolutely. And you're right. I mean, you mentioned their torture porn. And I think this is something that a lot of people, they might lump all of these films into one, whether it's Martyrs, Irreversible, High Tension, and then also Hostel Saw and some of these other movies we were getting in North America. What's the difference for you then? I mean, you've, you've touched upon it there already. Is there a kind of stylistic difference as well in these movies in, in terms of, you know, how is Eli Roth's Hostel, for example, different to Martyrs? <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> I think, you know, for as much as American kind of slasher films and, and uh, kind of, you know, gr uh, groundbreaking genre films that influence the French filmmakers, I find that in torture porn, they're so much more indebted to the kind of bad parts of the slasher film, yeah. like the disposable victims the kind of cheering on for the uh, for the villain, uh, you know, all of that kind of stuff, which sure, like, you know, I'll go to a screening of Friday the 13th part six and yay, Jason. But there's some point where it's like they wanted to 
reap the benefits of the politics that were happening at that time and show like, oh, look how like messed up conservatism is without actually commenting on it. Um, yeah. and, I, and I find those films, I've, I've watched most of them, I think, if not all of them. And I just find them a bit dull. Yeah, me too. They're me bit, too. They have that formulaic quality to them that I'm always just like, eh, yeah. sure. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I like the original Saw because I felt like that original one was maybe doing something a bit different to the rest of the series. But yeah, Hostel, yeah. they yes. seem to me, you're right. I think they have more in common with... Um, even splatter movies like those kind of Herschel Gordon Lewis ones or some of the 80s sl- slasher movement the, the kind of you, you basically let's be honest you go to watch them to watch people die and watch gory stuff happen that's kind of the thrill of watching those movies whereas yeah I don't think watching Trouble Every Day or Martyrs I'm watching it to, to see that stuff and get a thrill out of it. There's a different kind of reaction, I suppose, an emotional reaction, isn't there? Yeah, and I and I think oftentimes a film like Martyrs will get sold on, it's so fucking shocking, yeah. oh my God, it's so gory. But then when you actually, it's a bit like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. When you actually go to watch it, mm. the scenes with the actual visceral violence and like really upsetting like skin peeling stuff are actually quite minimal. Yeah. And I think often like people forget in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, there's not a whole lot of like massacring. <laughs> there's going no massacring. On. <laughs> not a yeah. lot. It's a yeah. different kind of like societal massacre. But um, yeah. you know, it's it's often it's living with these characters who are in trauma. They are so yeah. they are in traumatic experiences and you're with them. And that's I always think that's the kind of it's not a test, but you have to kind of say, like, I'm going to engage with this and I'm going to go on this journey. Or it's like, oh, I was expecting more like stabby, stab, stab. And yeah. that didn't happen. It's, so it's, it's always kind of it's going to be a hard sell for these films, no matter what. It, it is. And, you know, let, let me ask you about Martyrs. Because, you know, like you said, you kind of remember your life before seeing Martyrs and after it. And it's so true. I remember watching martyrs and the and you know i was a pretty by this point hardened horror fan and i remember really clearly thinking i can't do this like i was like i i genuinely don't know if i can sit through any more of this and get to the end of it because i found it so upsetting and so troubling and you're right you know when it comes to on-screen violence and gore it's not half as gory as many other movies out there um what is it about martyrs that makes it this infamous horror masterpiece do you think <laughs> Well, I think it's it's kind of part of two things, really. There is the um, uh, the kind of hype around it, the yeah. kind of notion of you know the actual scenes of like gore, let's yeah. call them, which are a few. Yeah. Um, and and you know, like I remember when it premiered at TIFF, there was, and I talk a little bit about uh, this with Colin Geddes in the book, who programmed a lot of these films at the Toronto International Film Festival, and there's this lore of like. Martyrs were so messed up, audience members were throwing up in the aisles. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so it has that reputation. But I think ultimately what it does is it grounds so much of this violence, so much of this trauma in, like, everyday kind of violence. It, one of the most upsetting scenes for me is um, when Anna is being held captive in in the situation and it's all the kind of banality of her torture Mm. and it's just this montage of her being tortured either um through being force fed being you know and just there's one scene where guys just punching her oh it's horrible And and it's like that scene to me that moment to me is more upsetting than, you know, her flesh being flayed off her body. God, yeah, it's yeah. Th- that banality of the endless kind of torture that she had to endure throughout the film and throughout this, you know, thing and, and the emotional stakes that are at it for her. Um, and, and I think often, you know, Pascal Laguerre, who, who wrote and directed the film, he has these moments of hope, but the moments of hope aren't what you think. Um, it's not like, she's going to get away and she's going to escape her captors. It's like, it's, it's a much more complicated, emotional kind of hope. Yeah. And I, I haven't really seen that done before and I haven't seen it done since, but it's really a film that asks a lot of you and it pulls you in a lot of different emotional directions. So when people say, I don't like martyrs, I think that's fine. It may not have interested you. It may have been too much for you. It may have been a variety of those things. Um, but I think for people who really respond to it, it's like, ooh, 
it, it causes a lot of introspection and a lot of thought. So this wave then kind of came to an end. And I just wondered, you know, do you see its influence on on horror that's come in this last decade because i was thinking about it and you know look at all of these movies now that kind of blend art house quote unquote or high brow or that horrible term elevated horror you know that kind of i wonder if in any way new french extremity had something to do with that um movies from filmmakers like ariaster or robert eggers um do you see any of that kind of new french extremity and some of those movies in some of the stuff we're getting now I think there is a bit of it. I, I think, you know, it's always the cyclical nature of film. Um, you know, if you want to say, like, The Exorcist and Rosemary's Baby was, you know, elevated horror back then, and now we've kind of come to this new cycle of it. However, I do feel like a film like Trouble Every Day, directed by Claire Denis, who is an incredibly, seemingly increasingly celebrated uh, director. Um, and, you know, it's okay for someone like, Ari Aster or Robert Eggers to say like, oh, I can really embrace horror right now because uh, Claire Denis did it. Um, you know, Gaspar Noé has kind of tackled this level of violence in his films. Um, and I think also it's interesting to see some of these um, new French extremity directors kind of return to it a bit themselves, like uh, Gaspar Noé with the climax. Yes. Um, and then, of course, there is uh, the film Raw by uh, Julia Ducarneau. And um, that's a really interesting film as well that can, you know, some people want to include it in New French Extremity. I'm not sure if it's there for me, but it definitely has this, you know, the human experience is not divorced from our bodies and from our visceral like bloody nature it's it's part of us and it's a part that should be explored because it's something that we are so scared of it is something that is so um even though it's it's part of our like we're touch like i'm touching my hands right now and it's right there but we don't want to we don't want to explore that and it's i don't know if it's our you know silly puritan ideas or anything like that but it's it's definitely a kind of place where I think there's a lot more ability to innovate in film and a lot more ways to shock and to push your audience. How do you find them? You're yeah, not I mean, the biggest fan, are you, of um, films like Midsummer and and Hereditary and these types oh. of films? No. <laughs> <laughs> mm -mm. Mm -mm. They seem to really, they, um, they definitely divide horror fans, don't they? I think they do. I, I mean, I, I think Ari Aster is uh, a good director. I don't think he's a good writer. Uh -huh, um, yeah. I think he needs someone else to kind of come in and like edit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Edit, That's fair. edit, edit. Yeah. Um, I, I love, I love Robert Eggers' films. Um, I've loved both of uh, Jordan Peele's films. Um, you know, there's, you know, a few others in that area that, um, you know, I think it's interesting to watch people play with creating something with messaging and how obvious or unobvious they want to be with it and seeing what audiences really respond to. Um, I mean, I, I remember watching Hereditary the weekend it came out and I was like, I don't get it. I don't get it. However, my partner was absolutely terrified about from it and still talks about moments in that film to this day. Um, so it's, it's, I always think horror is such a personal, um, such a personal genre because what scares me may not scare you and vice versa but I, I, it's it's a tricky one it's a it's a tricky one when people are trying to be like elevated um and it's like sometimes it just comes off as really pretentious and and what is your what is anyone's definition of pretension exactly for me it's midsummer <laughs> that's me <laughs> yeah that's fair um and <laughs> you know and weirdly now what do you think of the the trajectory of some of these filmmakers from this movement i mean gaspar noe is still very much doing his thing but you've got uh Alex Arja is, you know, making killer crocodile movies. And you've got Claire Denis, who's just made a sci-fi movie in space with Robert Pattinson. And, you know, I, I wonder if any of these guys will ever return to that kind of slightly darker uh, stuff that they did in their early career. I mean, I, I wonder about that quite a bit. And um, I, I think Gaspar Noé is always going to Gaspar Noé. He's just like... <laughs> yeah. Whatever the fuck, guys, I'm Gaspar Noé. Yeah. Uh, and you're going to watch what I do because it's crazy. So here it is. Yeah. Uh, and I really appreciate that about him. Um, and Claire Denis, I think, is kind of, you know, elevating. It's, you know, she's finally, if 
you, she wasn't before, really being put amongst those ranks of great directors, uh, not just female directors, directors. Um, and so I, I think High Life is a really interesting film that it's like, what could a big, you know, quote unquote, big budget art house Robert Pattinson film look like? Um, and I think that's very interesting. Um, and then Alex Aja is such an interest, like he made horns. Yeah. He, uh, he did uh, the, the, what was that crawl? Yeah. Uh, the crocodile movie that we were just mentioning. And um, it's all very, uh, he's a bit all over the place. And I get the sense that he's just trying to kind of take opportunities when they come to him, which anyone has to do in the film industry. Um, I know the, the two guys who made inside uh, were attached to multiple projects. None of them, which really came together. I still would have loved to have seen their version of Hellraiser. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. It's, and you know, I think so many of those guys made a kind of indie splash and then they were, you know, snapped up by a, uh, uh, like, Dimension Extreme, which is one of the funniest, um, you know, logo sequences I ever see at the start of the film because it's, you know, Dimension Films, the subsidiary, subsidiary of Miramax, and it's Dimension, and then it goes, Extreme! Brilliant. And it's so good. And then, um, you know, they, they were all kind of signed into remakes and things like that, and I talk a bit about that in the book. Mm. And uh, I think a lot of them struggled to find their footing because they went from making these indie films you know, relatively in France, to making a remake of, you know, a J-horror film with Jessica yeah. Alba. And <laughs> yeah. what does that look like when you suddenly have a studio and expectations and uh, a larger budget behind you? And then yeah. you kind of go like, is this really still for me? Do, are these the kind of movies I want to make? And so I think someone like Alex Aja is quite interesting because I think he's trying to kind of find his own way through it. And I think, um, you know, given the amount of films he's made since uh, High Tension, it's working to a certain extent. Yeah, absolutely. I actually thought Cruel was quite effective, apart from a few dodgy CGI moments here and there. <laughs> I thought it was he, It was good, though. It was good kind of classic suspense monster movie, which I was all yeah. for, you know? Um, yeah. What do you think, finally then, what do you think the future is now of French horror? I mean, like you said, that movement has kind of been and gone. Um, do you see any new trends or any new waves with French horror now? Or is it all in the unknown, I suppose? You know, I, I think it's all in the unknown right now. Mm. Um, my, my sense is we're going to see some very, something, we're going to see something big. Um, as we move out of lockdown, because it's one of the first times the industry has actually had to stop to do a full stop. And, and you know, yes, there's still stuff in development. Deals are still being signed. Writers are still writing. Like, there's still stuff happening. But I think there's it's going to be interesting to see what is some of the first stuff to come out of, you know, creation in this period. Um, we have uh, an incredible amount of, you know, medical uncertainty right now. We have an incredible amount of societal uncertainty right now and violence. And I think it's going to really start to change, maybe not the way we make movies, but the kind of stories we tell and the kind of stories that are, you know, going to be said are important. Um, so I, you know, I, I think in France, I haven't seen a whole bunch come out of there. Raw was kind of the last big one. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think the French are in my study of them and my, you know, thinking about them, they rarely back down from a challenge. Um, and I, I think that we might, we might see some really interesting stuff coming out of that, uh, area of the world. And I think from the rest of the world as well. Absolutely. Um, it's such a fascinating era and there's so much more we can talk about, but there's so much more information that people can read in your book. Um, <laughs> where can people find your book out there? Um, is it available in all the usual places? Yeah, available in all the usual places. Um, you can check out uh, the publisher, uh, McFarland Books. Um, they have that as well as uh, my nine, uh, 1990s teen horror cycle book. Mm. Uh, so you can get that there. And yeah, nice. yeah, check it out or check out your local library. And uh, if, if you're tight on cash, which I think a lot of people are, always request it at your local library and you can get it into the system there. 
Nice. I was rereading it on lockdown and I was thinking it would have been nice to I was thinking it would have been nice to have an audio book. Could you could you record an audio book, Alex? Is that all right? Oh, psh, sh- I, what else am I doing? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, I thought it would be nice for my like one hour of exercise a day. I could have I could have listened to some new French extremity. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for joining me, Alex. It's been such a treat um, to chat to you. Um, final question for you, which I always ask everyone at the end. What's your favorite horror movie, Alex? You're only allowed to pick one. What's your favorite horror movie? Such a cliche, but it's The Shining. Good choice. I Good love choice. it. I love it. It changes each time I watch it. Yeah. The older I get, somehow it gets scarier. Um, it's it's such a... It, it has so many elements to it that shouldn't work, but yeah. it does. Yeah. And um, it, it just fascinates me. I'm, I'm endlessly intrigued by it. I find it endlessly watchable. Um and uh, I, I have a hard time imagining a better or more perfect film. Doctor Sleep? Yes? No? I I liked it. I was surprised by yeah. how much I liked it. I thought I was going to fucking hate it. <laughs> yeah. um, and I was very pleasantly surprised. Um, I, I, you know, I, the one thing that just really killed me about it was Ewan McGregor's real dodgy American accent. Yeah. Um, I, it's it, like he... It's it's a hard thing for you know actors from the UK to do a, an American accent. You'll see it also in Benedict Cumberbatch, but they like have <laughs> yeah. this thing where they over enunciate everything they say, so it always mm. sounds very flat. Right, and right, it's right. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but other than Ewan McGregor, I thought it was like it was great. It was great. Yeah. It's a great companion piece to it. It certainly was. Yeah, um, Alex, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you so much for having me. A big thank you to the incredible Alex West there. Such a treat to get her on my podcast because she is a bit of a podcast hero of mine. Um, So thank you again, Alex, for joining me. And if there's anyone out there listening who, for some reason, I mean, there's probably two of you, Max, that haven't listened to Faculty of Horror, please do give it a listen. They've actually got an incredible episode on Martyrs as well, which you must check out. So it's time then. Let's begin our deep dive discussion of Pascal Logier's Martyrs. Now, joining me to discuss all things martyrs, I've got a brand new guest and another kind of podcasting and blogging hero of mine. Uh, She's actually one of the original horror bloggers. She launched her blog, Final Girl, um, God knows, at least 10 years ago, I think. Um, She was one of the first major horror bloggers out there. uh, And she now also co-hosts one of my favourite podcasts, Gay Lords of Darkness with uh, Anthony Hudson, which is as smart as it is absolutely hilarious. So I'm honoured to have her here joining me today. Uh, joining me to discuss all things martyrs, it's Stacey Ponder. Hello, Stacey. Hi, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. Um, how's 2020 been for you? 2020 has been incredible. <laughs> Just a year of growth and joy and everything else that everyone is experiencing. Um, mm-hmm. Now, I am slowly rotting in my apartment. I've been here for eight months. You know how it is in 2020. And also, you know, bring on, what, January 20th for you guys? That's pretty exciting. That's kind of exciting. I'm trying still not to get my hopes up. Yeah. Like, even now, I'm still like, well, you never know how this is going to go. Oh, God, I know. And I, I also, I know what you mean. Like, you, you feel like you can't really relax yet or celebrate until it's happened, right? Until the 20th comes. Yeah. Like, I've always depended on, like, whoever wins. Okay, well... At least we're one of those countries where there's a peaceful transfer of power and everything's fine. And it's like now it it still feels really up in the air to me. Like, I think it's going to be fine. But also, like, the last four years have been just every day we sink a little lower. So I'm just like, well, we'll see what happens at the end of January, I guess. Although I will say I do daydream about, like, oh, maybe next year some, like, we'll go a day without any new fuckery you know like yes yes just imagine a day where there's not nonsense <laughs> God, <laughs> just, I, do, just a day just a day it's i mean it's the same here with us and yeah. everything that's been going on with brexit and everything and like we, we were saying the other day like remember about I don't know how many years ago when politics was just kind of boring and like you didn't have to worry about it every single day, you know, every miss boring day. politics. Oh, no yeah. kidding. Like what now? What <laughs> What can there be? This is this has to be the limit. And then, you know, 
No, it's, it's like it's very it mirrors martyrs, right? Like, okay, <laughs> what else are you gonna throw at me? And then the next Yeah, how much and, worse can this get? <laughs> and then it's just like, oh, Rudy Giuliani farted today in the Chamber of Congress. Like, whatever. There's just, you know, something. <laughs> Oh God! Well, uh, something that something that has got me through this year um, has been listening to Gay Lords of Darkness every single week. So thank you so much for that and making me laugh every week. Um, just for anyone out there who has never heard this podcast, tell us a little bit about it and kind of how it got started. Um, oh well, let's see. It got started because you know I had, I've had my blog Final Girl for a really long time, and I thought. Boy, the kids are podcasting these days, aren't they? That's what they're doing. It seems a lot easier than writing, you know, to just, <laughs> yeah. just like hook up a microphone and say whatever I want to say is so much yeah, easier. just talk. Yeah. yeah. So then I proposed doing a podcast to uh, Anthony Hudson, a friend of mine. And I thought we would click really well. And so we just decided to do it. And every week, every Wednesday, we have an episode where we talk about a horror movie, talk about a lot of other nonsense. Um Largely through a queer lens. Um, we don't always do, you know, gay movies, but we find a way to make every movie gay. Like, there's almost always it. a queer reading of a movie, as far as I'm concerned. I know. I, I love it. I love <laughs> discovering why every horror movie is gay in some way. It's, it's such a joy. It's like, such uh, a joy. Well, she was wearing sneakers. Oh, dyke. Okay. You know, like, whatever. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's definitely like we do get serious at times and we do love to sort of pick apart movies, but it's also very lighthearted. Um, it's so it's so great. And actually, yeah, your your blog. I mean, so you've been writing for The Final Girl for how long now? How long has that blog been going? Uh, since 2005. So that's incredible. So, I mean, yeah. that's you must have been one of the first right in that kind of in that world of horror blogging. I think so. It was, yeah, there was like a very tiny circle of horror bloggers. Um, a friend of mine wrote for one and everybody was kind of covering a different, like one person did the real kind of extreme, like grindhouse movies and somebody else mm-hmm. was really into monsters and that sort of thing. But nobody was talking about slasher movies. So I just, I had never written anything for public consumption at all. I did, had no idea really how to use the computer, the internet. And uh, it showed. You were kind of winding, <laughs> winding up the dial-up modem back then. It was a dial-up modem, and I had no <laughs> idea how to like find pictures on the internet. So I would like, oh, if yeah. I, I would like dig out my old horror movie magazines <laughs> and like yeah. scan the pictures and then upload pictures. Like just oh, such a lot of trying, like cave it's a lot of work it was a lot that's, of work yeah that's amazing yeah that's fantastic well, congrats on on you know still going with with final girl it's absolutely incredible um and actually you know speaking you like you said you, you know you started off writing of of slashes that's going to be one of my first questions for you you know what's your favorite subgenre of horror if you have one is it slashes not anymore not anymore mm. i you know when I was a child, I liked childish things, okay? But I'm a woman now. <laughs> You've matured. <Okay. laughs> I've matured. No, it's just, um, they were what I grew up with, you know, watching yeah. 80s slasher movie, which was the, high, the, high, the heyday of the genre, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, but new slasher movies really don't do it for me. I still love the old ones. I will still, if you, here's a movie I've never seen from 1983, a slasher movie, like, okay, gimme, gimme. But- I'm not interested in the new ones. It's just not sort of where my heart is anymore. So, um, favorite '80s slasher, please, Stacey. What's your favorite? Oh my gosh! I really am into Friday the Thirteenth Part Two and Three. Oh yeah, good choices. I I love the three D of of Part Three as well. So funny. They have like the two best final girls, as far as I'm concerned. They're fun. Yeah. They've got some gore. Like they, I just think they're. I have a real soft. That's that's my series. I think. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Big ones. I think that's the one I love the most. So. So good, and and that early era of Friday the Thirteenth is so great. Like kind of one to four, you know, so yes. much fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now I'm just like. Well, do the people have to get hurt in the horror movie? <laughs> yeah. Can't we just talk in a dark room? 
But I've, I'm really into, I like supernatural stuff. I love found footage. I am such a sucker for found footage, no matter how bad it is. Mm. I will love it. Any Asian horror movie, I will love it, no matter how bad it is. I don't care. Yes, I'm with you there. Absolutely. Um, so this episode, Stacey, we're recording it. Obviously, it's December right now, but it's going out on January 1st. So let me first say to you, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. You know... You say to yourself, oh boy, 2021's going to be my year for sure. I'm so ready. And then you watch <laughs> Martyrs and you say, oh, oh, <laughs> life is unending misery and pain. <laughs> okay. What yeah. is, uh, what's your New Year's? I, I, I want a horror related New Year's resolution. What have you got for me? Oh boy. Um, (laughs) Either to become like the actual witch in the neighborhood, like to go full feral beast woman and just really lean into like my pandemic isolation and just become the woman on the block that all the children are afraid of, if I'm not already. (laughs) Like just full swamp hag in downtown Portland, Maine, you know. Uh, or I would like to sort of uh, publish, have something published. Like I've got my blog and I think about mm. my mortality, you know, and I say, <laughs> well, when I die, Your what, legacy, happens, yeah. what happens to my beautiful legacy of talking about like, you know, mustaches and horror movies or whatever. <laughs> So I figure if there's something published that people can clutch to their bosoms as they mourn me when I'm gone, then that'll be good. So. I'd love that. Yeah, get yourself a book. Yeah, yeah. Just write a book. I mean, sure, it's easy as that, isn't it? Just write yeah, a book. Yeah, I'll sure. just write a book yeah. this year. No big deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well. Um, amazing. So we are, we're here to talk about the fun topic of, of uh, martyrs and new French extremity. Um <gasps> Woo. Um, previously to this, actually, our last episode just before Christmas was t- discussing Inside, that, you know, that ah. Christmas classic that is Inside. <laughs> um, what do you, what, what are your thoughts on this this particular movement of films, these new French extremity, everything from kind of irreversible to Inside to, you know, high tension and all these others? Are, are you a fan personally of these films? I am a fan. Um, mm. They're a lot Right, oh <laughs> like they are a lot. Yeah. When the French do it, they really do it. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Inside is kind of a good Christmas movie, though, right? Like she wants to unwrap that present. She does, <laughs> and, she, and, and spoiler alert, she does. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's it was such a, a a window, like it was such a period of time when these movies were coming out, and it it, mm-hmm. it feels like it had its moment and those people worked out whatever they needed to work out in their psyches. Yeah. 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 And, uh, but I do, I really love a lot of them, even though I'm not one who's really super into extreme horror and a lot of violence and all that. Yeah. Yeah. That was going to be my next question for you. Actually, I was going to ask, you know, how, how are you with that kind of, yeah, what people would, would label extreme. So the classics, you know, like cannibal Holocaust and that kind of thing. And of course, I guess the stuff that we were getting in, in North America at this time too, like, Eli Roth movies and that kind of stuff. Um, how do you feel about those movies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the classic sort of extreme movies. I saw most of them when I was a teenager because mm-hmm. that's that's a teenager thing to do is like rent yeah. these movies you're probably not supposed to be renting, and and check them out. So I saw most of them back then. Um, the whole torture porn era with American movies, the Eli Roth stuff, all the Saw movies. I never got yeah. into those. And so maybe I'm just willing to give the French some slack because it's French, you know? So I'm like, well, it must, it must be an art movie if it's French. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, know. It, I know. But I think there is something different, though, actually, isn't there? It, it feels tonally... I don't know. Like I was saying this to someone else on the podcast that, you know, when you watch Hostel, it kind of feels like you are you're meant to kind of have fun with it. Like, I don't know, there's a feeling like, kind of like with slashes, I suppose, that you go to the movies on a Friday night and you watch you watch a boy getting his eyeball cut out on Hostel or something. And I think you're kind of supposed to laugh and kind of have a bit of a good time in that kind of gross, you know, gory splatter movie kind of way. Whereas I think when you watch a French extreme, a new French extremity movie, I don't think we're invited to laugh or have fun at, at the gore and torture that we're witnessing, right? I think there's a tonal difference. Absolutely. Even if it's crazy over the top, yeah. you know, it's not um, Peter Jackson's Dead Alive where you're just laughing <laughs> exactly. at how crazy it is. It's like these movies are very serious. 
despite how violent and bloody they are, but they're not necessarily meant to titillate. Yeah, totally. And like you said, that's that's the difference. And I think what I realized, I think High Tension was actually the first of this subgenre that I saw. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, this movie actually has something to say. Like it has a point to it. And I don't yes. feel that that's, and maybe because I haven't exposed myself to a lot of Eli Roth films. Is he trying to say something? I'm not sure. Yeah, I do, yeah. I mean, he says he is. I'm not sure. I'm, yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, so, without further ado, let's get into it, Stacey. Let's discuss Pascal Logier's Martyrs from 2008. <laughs> Elle était enfermée dans une chambre froide. Elle vivait là. Elle n'a pas été violée, c'est une certitude. Lucie ne raconte pas ce qu'elle a vécu. Pourquoi tu crois qu'on a besoin de toi Lucie, vous voulez attraper les gens qui ont fait du mal à Lucie. So Stacy, usually I would ask my guests to give me a little brief plot synopsis of what this week's film is all about. Stacy, what's Martyrs all about? Oh, wow. Um, I mean, it's about... Uh, <laughs> you've listened to my show. You know how bad I am at the box <laughs> <and office. laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what is it about? It's about, it's to me, it's this love story between these two women, one of whom was horribly mm. abused. They take revenge on the people who uh, abused her. And then it goes horribly yeah. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it does so so wrong um so let me ask you my first question for you i guess is what what do you think of this film and sort of tell me a little bit about your own personal history and relationship with this film sort of how you first discovered it and and, and what your thoughts on the movie are <sighs> i think i mean martyrs has a reputation right like it's it's one of those movies that is on the list of like movies that are gonna break your brain or you you know you dare someone to watch martyrs like the most extreme movies which are, are not my you know they're not my thing i have no desire to watch a serbian film you know <laughs> just, i'm just not, i'm just not really interested so why did i watch martyrs i think because i loved high tension and inside so much and i thought mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to watch this and form my own opinion of it. And I mean, this movie is devastating. It is. Yeah, that's the word for it, isn't it? It's absolutely devastating. It's one of the most upsetting movies I've ever seen. And in that regard, I think it kind of lives up to the hype in a way. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think mm -hmm. actually this movie does uh kind of it kind of deserves the reputation it has i think because when i first saw this movie it absolutely devastated me um i thought i knew what i was in for i thought i could handle it and i remember this moment i was watching it on my own in the house and i remember this moment in the final act of the film where i just i just like stood up with my head in my hands and i walked up and down in the living room and just was like no, I can't do. I can't. I can't sit through any more of this. You know, it. Um, it for me is probably one of the few films that is deserving of its reputation as one of the most extreme movies ever made. You know, I think that it's terrifying. It's devastating. It's grueling. It's torturous. Um, and it's brilliant as well. I mean, I think uh, I watched it only for the second time ever this week in preparation for this, and it was exactly as grueling and upsetting as I remember it being ten years ago. Yeah, it's. Um, I watched it <clears throat> like I told you earlier. I watched it this morning to prepare for the show. <laughs> yes, sorry <laughs> yeah. and thank you. <laughs> yeah, over my pancakes and coffee, just settled down with martyrs, you know. Um, and it's still, like, I still, I've seen it several times now, so I know mm -hmm. what's going to happen. And there were certain points where I was like, okay, now I think I'm going to go wash my breakfast dishes while this part plays out. <laughs> you know, know. <laughs> like, it's still so effective no matter what. And I would like to take this opportunity to apologize to the people that I've shown this film to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because I do love this film, which feels like a very strange thing to say, but I think it's got so much underneath the surface of it mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's what I want to share with people. And so I've been like, let's watch Martyrs. And then we watch Martyrs and my my friends are just like hollow eyed and traumatized afterwards. And I'm like, oh, I'm, yeah, you're, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily the best film to watch in a group either, I don't think, is it? Like, it kind yeah. of feels, I kind of feel like it's quite a, it's, it's almost like a personal experience that you kind of just have to sit with yourself in a weird way, you know? It's, uh, but, but, it, but, you're, but, but also, I'm the same as you, I do love it and I want to show people it, but it's also one of the most grueling and least fun films you can possibly watch, right? Yeah. It's not a Halloween party horror movie. You know, you don't just throw on martyrs while everybody's drinking their beer. You know, it is. I I feel like it, it does. I think you're right. It does sort of lend itself to solitary viewing. Yeah. For sure. Um, how do you find it in you know in in relation to that hype of you know oh it's you know the most extreme movie ever made and all that kind of thing you know how how do you find it personally did it sort of affect you viscerally when you first watched it um <clears throat> yes the first time i watched this i watched it by myself and at one point i said out loud like okay that's enough yeah. <laughs> it got to it was it, one of the times at the end where we're going through the cycle of abuse with anna where it's uh-huh. just days are passing you know someone comes in the room and does something horrible to her and then it fades to black and then we get the next day or whatever um yeah at one point during that cycle i had my fill um yeah <clears throat> and it's it's the movie just haunted me and it still haunts me um but i think it's strange in that it is one of the most extreme movies et cetera, et cetera, but not in the way you anticipate what that's going to mean mm. you know it's not uh it's not eli roth it's not hostile it's not the the violence is much more intimate <clears throat> and it's more concerned with the aftermath of the violence yes than the violence itself um and it just, I think part of the reason why it's such a devastating movie is because of the way it's constructed, which you don't notice at first. But it just, if you have seen any other horror movies, this completely plays with your expectations and destroys all the tropes that we all know. That's it. That's, it's it's very clever. And I know that some people kind of, some people throw a crit- like this as a criticism at the film that it it kind of feels like two movies, right? There is a sort of, there's a sort of turning point about midway through the film where mm-hmm. you, it's kind of like, ah, oh, you think you're watching something extreme? Just wait, let, wait till we've got what, what we've got coming next, you know? And it is tonally and structurally and narratively, it just kind of completely shifts, doesn't it, in the second half? Um, and like you, that's the stuff that I really couldn't take. You know, I, I think the first time I watched it and I'd heard its reputation and that first half is still pretty grueling. It's still pretty oh, nasty, yeah. but I was kind of like in in, a, in, a, in more of a genre way, I think. And I was like, OK, this is pretty this is pretty hardcore, but I can take it. It's fine. That's fine. It's like a home invasion. And it's, you know, and then I was completely not prepared for what happened in that second half and like you say those kind of repetitive sort of little vignettes or whatever they are those repeated scenes of just brutality and torture that just feel like they're never going to end as well um yeah and it's like we said earlier it's not titillating at all we don't see the people doing the abuse we're not focused on them he really focuses on the victims but it's not even horror movie victim quote unquote like you know anna's not screaming in pain you know just the way everything is approached in this movie just puts the audience right in it and it's very intimate and very uncomfortable and it becomes really hard to take you know Mm -hmm. and and just the way it's like you said it has a turning point and i think like you said a lot of people are oh i like this half of the movie but not this half of the movie that sort of thing and there are plenty of people who think this movie is nothing but an excuse to show women being tortured you know Uh uh-huh uh-huh well yeah i mean i mean we can get into all of that as we go but i mean i i you know I guess the film is very much about women being tortured in a way, right, but there is, yeah. I think like you say, there's more, there's more to it than that. And I think what's really interesting as well is that when we think extreme, we think gore. And uh, what I find quite interesting is that 
you know, I've had a couple of friends say to me, like, oh, I've, I've still not had the courage to watch Martyrs. How gory does it get? You know, I can't even stand, you know, a Lucio Fulci movie. And I was like, well, actually, you can't really... It's not gory in the way that a Fulci movie is, is it? You know, I wouldn't say it's actually as filled with blood and guts and gore as, you know, Fulci, Eli Roth, or some of these other directors. It's 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 more sort of emotionally uh, traumatic in a way. Yes, yeah, especially the the second half. Um, mm. The first half has some of the outrageous, you know, straight up violence yeah. in it, but it's not anything to be laughed at. Like that's part of the fun of a Fulci movie. It's like cringing and going, "Oh no!" When inevitably <laughs> yeah. something sharp goes through an eyeball, right? Like, yes, that's, yeah, that's gonna happen. And it's fun, kind of gore. There's nothing fun about Martyrs. It's there's no. <laughs> not a single second of levity in this movie at all uh, that's it you know anna is chained to a chair and essentially being tortured it's but it's not like horror movie torture it's not some crazy person who comes in and is i'm gonna pull out your fingernails and then we can watch the fingernails come out and go oh that's gross it's a woman being beaten with someone like a, a man is beating her with his fist it's torture i mean it is literally torturous to 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 actually get through that's the thing which is mm-hmm. it's so powerful um so let me just fl- rewind back to the beginning i mean let's let me ask you a little bit about the, the, the this introduction of these two characters because you know the, the film begins doesn't it with that horrific kind of scene of of lucy as a child kind of escaping captivity um we have that really horrific i mean literally the first shot of this film right is a child essentially like a, a a child who looks like she's been stripped and beaten and tortured and abused escaping and running down the street screaming and crying that is the first image of martyrs that we see and then of course we go into this introduction and it's it's amazing actually how much ground it covers and how well it sets everything up. But we get this introduction. This little girl, her name's Lucy. She goes to this uh, kind of hospital orphanage type place where she meets Anna, and the two of them sort of begin this friendship. But Lucy is clearly being very much haunted, right, by everything that has happened to her. And we still don't really know what this film is at this point. We don't really know what we're watching. She's being haunted by this thing, this ghost, right, this monster, this manifestation of her trauma, her guilt, whatever it might be. But it's it's more your traditional horror film at this point in that it's kind of jump scary and it's, it's monstrous and it's you know, properly frightening. Um, that moment when the the that thing, that creature, that woman, whatever it is, is 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 hiding under the bed and everything. And actually, I think something that doesn't get said enough about this film and about Logier is that he is a very good horror director you know just creating that classic kind of monster movie suspense is all there in the first act of this film i think what what do you think of it and the way in which he sets up this story i think it does uh i think he does a very good job logier by Mm. giving us very little i think he trusts the audience to Mm -hmm. build the relationship between these two characters and to sort of flesh out this world and I think if you're right. At this point, it feels like, oh, is this like a supernatural movie? Is this like a monster movie? And she could because you yeah. have no idea what she went through at the beginning. The movie, you know, begins with this horribly abused child bursting through the door of a warehouse. Like this movie yeah. starts at ten and yes. doesn't let up through the entire thing. Yeah, you know? and we have no yeah. idea what she's gone through. Um, but through the little snippets, through little a line of dialogue here or a glance, or we learn how Anna is the only one that Lucy relates to at this orphanage or whatever it is. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just the footage of them off in the corner together, huddled. You know, Lucy has pushed everyone else away, but for some reason, Anna can get through to her and so becomes her caretaker from the earliest days. Yeah. Yeah. And th- that is one of the things I think about this film that makes it so gut wrenching and devastating is that it, it. I think it feels like it has so much empathy, doesn't it? I, I, it feels yes. like a film filled with empathy to me, where you just feel so much for these two characters, don't you? And actually, we we kind of learn relatively little about them, especially Anna as a person and what she's been through in her life. But I don't know. Yeah, like you said, it, Logia gives us so little, but manages to sort of convey so much with that Mm -hmm. in a weird way yeah it's uh it's he's definitely on the side of the victims which 
we don't always know that that's true in horror movies. The victims are often very expendable. Um, yeah. And here they're not, <laughs> you know, and yeah. it's it's not a nice, neat package. It doesn't follow the sort of it, it. It plays with the tropes of like, say, like a rape revenge movie. Mm-hmm. But but he gives us the revenge at the beginning before we know anything. And so there's no catharsis in it for us. <laughs> as audience yeah, members that's exactly it in fact he does quite the opposite doesn't he 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 kind of pulls the rug over our eyes because we are then we then after we're introduced to these two little girls we then cut to 15 years later and suddenly we 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 are introduced to this family a group of um white middle class people in this quite plush affluent home mm-hmm. living a normal everyday life it seems perfectly innocent mundane every day then it it slowly starts to turn out that oh, are these people the ones that tortured, <laughs> tortured Lucy when Lucy bursts into their house to kill them? And there's this burst of violence, right? Yeah, and it, it you know it it literally bursts in <laughs> with that shotgun, oh and yeah. we as audience members we have no idea what's going on. You might put it together that oh, this is the little girl from the beginning. She's grown up. It's fifteen years later. Yeah. Um, but you have no idea what's going on. And what happens is we end up siding with the family. Yeah. The white, upper middle class family. And I think that's one of the major themes of this movie, whether Logier intended it or not, is you have these two likely queer on some level yeah. uh, women, women of color. You know, Anna is Moroccan French and Lucy is Chinese French. Mm. Um, and we have them doing the work of the wealthy white people. And it's sort of a look at um, the way rampant capitalism just sort of pummels the lower classes who have to suffer and do all of the work while the upper classes reap the rewards. But what happens is, you know, when Lucy comes in and blows away this nice family, this perfect nuclear family, we're on the side of the family believing them. And so is Anna, which ultimately leads to everything that comes at the end of the movie. It's so true. It's a brilliant, It's it plays really cleverly with our expectations, doesn't it? I think like seeing this kind of affluent family just be a normal family, you know, you do straight away just go, well, they they can't be the killers and torturers, right? I mean, I, I definitely thought that the first time I saw it. And I know that there is that, there's that tension as to, you know, is Lucy actually remembering this correctly? Or is she, you know, has she had all of that clouded you know Mm -hmm. and um it really kind of plays with that doesn't it all throughout this first act of the film and you're right you know we do empathize with the with the family well he does such a good job at making lucy an unreliable narrator also given given her hallucinations and given how sort of unhinged she is because she's been triggered by this photograph that was in the newspaper Mm -hmm. you know it's not to say that she was perfectly fine for 15 years and then this happened like she's obviously had a terrible life a very yeah. troubled life, but seeing them in the paper brought it all back immediately. Um, and you know, women aren't believed, right? Yeah. Believe them. That's the thing is like, believe women doesn't mean that every woman is telling the truth, etc. It just means listen to what they say, take them at their word and then see how it goes. And yeah, we don't do that as an audience. And unfortunately, Anna doesn't do that as well in this instance yeah that's such an interesting moment isn't it because the first act of this film you know lucy arrives at the house she brutally murders this family at this point we have no idea whether lucy is just completely lost it you know or whether she's right in that this family were her torturers anna as her best friend like us doesn't really know what's going on doesn't know whether to believe lucy even though she loves lucy and so there is that tension there between them and these two are clearly so close they're clearly there for each other but then there is that moment where one of the family the mother turns out not to be dead she's still alive and in that bathtub and Anna instinctively goes to help her doesn't she behind Lucy's back she tries to help her escape and I never quite know is that a moment where we're seeing that Anna doesn't actually believe Lucy um, or is Anna just helping out a human being in need because the one thing we learn about Anna is that she's clearly such a she's such a pure compassionate person right but but either way that's the that is the action that sort of causes this 
rift between them at that point. Right. It all collapses because, you know, Lucy has been saying, like, why don't you believe me? Why don't you believe me? And then at that point, she says, you never believed me. Yeah. And so it's just like the entire relationship crumbles and Lucy runs outside and kills herself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? God, God, Christ. It's, I know. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's, it's heavy going. But you're right, you know, that that because clearly these two have had an incredibly close relationship for 15 years now. The fact that they're mm-hmm. still together doing this now. Do you see, how do you see this relationship? Is it um, a queer relationship between these two or is it just a kind of sisterly best friend thing? Because there is that brief moment, isn't there, where they share a kiss yes. in the bathroom surrounded by the dead children. And, yeah. uh, which I always think is quite funny. Like the, It's probably the tenderest moment in the, right, <laughs> in the yeah, whole Right, yeah, not the best timing, Anna. Okay, now it's not the time. Um, I think it's up to us to decide whether that was a first kiss or not. Mm -hmm. To me, it's not. Like, who knows what Lucy is capable of in terms of any kind of relationship, you know, at all. Never mind. I mean, even just a friendship, who knows what she's actually capable of um, and can consent to or whatever. But to me, this is this movie is absolutely a love story between mm-hmm. the two of them. Um, I think that's it explains a lot of Anna's actions late in the film that I know you have questions about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but And also when Anna talks on the phone with her mother, um, and it just seems like t- t- the mother, you know, calls Lucy a pervert, which I think is very strange. Oh, uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, and says, yeah. like, are you still with her? You're under her influence. She's a pervert. What are you doing with her? So, and because actually, when that kiss happens, Anna is very much the instigator, isn't she? Of that yeah. kiss, as I remember rightly, yeah. Um, which is really interesting. But uh, Lucy doesn't. Yeah. I, well, Lucy doesn't push her away violently. You know, it doesn't. Yes. It's so, and I think that is a key. Also, that it could be. Like, what are you doing right now? <laughs> you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. I mean, I, 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 and like I've just made a joke about it. It's like, well, maybe that wasn't the time for that. You know? Right? Yeah. Like, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> Look all yeah. around us, and we're both covered in blood, and you know. But at the least, at the least, Anna is in love with Lucy. I think, and yes, yes, love doesn't have to be requited to be real. And so just to me, I think that's sort of the emotional through line of this movie. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of agree with you. I just I find it really interesting because in some ways the film it feels very like you said earlier, it's there's nothing really titillating about it. There's nothing very leery about it, I don't think, in any way. It's kind of quite sensitively handled in the way it in the in the sort of the gaze on these two women yes. i suppose it feels like right and um and in some ways i was thinking is this you know if it wasn't for that kiss it, it would this just kind of be almost a complete asexual movie in a way i don't know whether you agree with that but it kind of feels that way to me i i know what you mean absolutely it's let me as a as a woman watching a movie like this let me tell you early on like in the very early stages when child lucy has escaped and yeah. they're they're walking through the warehouse and he says one thing for sure is that she wasn't raped to me as like a woman watching this i'm just like phew like yeah, thank god yeah thank god we're not gonna have to deal with sexual violence hopefully and mm-hmm. there is none like you said and it's, i think this movie is really interesting because there's no male gaze on these women there's also conversely no female gaze it's like yes. the, only, the only gaze there is is the audience's gaze. Yeah. Which then yeah. you have your big brain moment when at the end it says martyrs to witness. And you say, yes. oh, my God, where are the martyrs? Where are uh, the witnesses? Where are the there witnesses? It is. It's very, um, it's very cold and objective. The viewpoint in the second half, isn't it? But in the first half, we are, we are kind of quite, uh, we are aligned with Lucy, aren't we? Up until a point, because we're sort of seeing that monster. We're seeing what she's seeing in a way. Um, yeah. And then there's a very interesting turning point where you know when she's she, we actually kind of see a kind of objective view of her um, interacting with that monster, and and there's nobody there. She's got her hands on nothing, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the first moment when the film's 
sort of suddenly starts to shift. But um, but I do love those scenes of that that monster really really freaks me out. I don't know about yeah. you, but the moment the mo- I think that like again, um, Logier is is brilliant at doing just that sort of traditional horror where we we kind of catch glimpses of this kind of monstrous thing, sort of on the periphery or hiding behind something oh or hiding under something. You know, under the bathtub when you just kind of see the cr- the like manic eye. It's very like Black Christmas behind the door, you know, just Yes. It's oh god, it's it's absolutely terrifying and that's why I love the small moments like where Lucy when Lucy finally submits to it at the end mm-hmm. when she when she thinks that Anna has doesn't believe her and everything is lost and she submits to it and there's also a kind of tenderness for a few yeah. moments from the monster where she just kind of accepts that she has to live like she's never going to be rid of this guilt and pain and shame and all of that it's really beautiful yeah. it is in a really fucked it, up way but you yeah know. <laughs> it is it is no that's it it's kind of it, it's just the kind of emotional rawness that you're not necessarily expecting to see in a yes. in a kind of extreme gore genre movie are you that's the thing i think that's what sort of takes everyone by yes. surprise so much and i think we're still like you said like we're still in this place at this point in the movie where we don't really know what the movie is like i don't know about how you felt the first time you watched this but i i kind of kept thinking where is this going like we're still not even halfway through yet and she's murdered we've seen her murder an entire family and she's killed these two children and 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 i don't know like i was kind of thinking because at the beginning i thought okay i get it it's going to be a kind of home invasion and it's going to be about will she manage to kill this family and will they be really her captures and everything and then that is all kind of dealt with pretty quickly. And I, and it's just that, it's a kind of really exciting feeling, I think, in that where you're put in that unsafe position as a viewer, where you're just like, I have no idea what this movie is, you know? Right. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we get the emotional climax, I think, is when Lucy kills herself. That's like, for me, that's the emotional climax of the movie. And that comes at the, like, 45-minute mark. That's the part where I, I would like to go, okay, turn it off now. Yeah, <laughs> turn it off. This is bad enough. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, just wait. See what it has in store for you. But then you're like, oh, my God, we're only halfway through the movie. And that's why it's. I think it's so brilliant and so devastating in a sneaky kind of way is because he's obviously a seasoned horror fan. Who knows how to play with our expectations? It's like horror movies are, okay, there are victims, and then we find out who's killing the victims, and then one of the victims gets empowered, and then the killer is vanquished, and then we're all happy. Yes. Yeah. And he upends that. It starts with revenge. Um, We end up with a final girl, basically, who, you know, doesn't survive. Um, Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. just real life is not as neat as a horror movie plot. So. That's it, and it, and it's that kind of like backdoor final girl, like a kind of because sl- I think you, I, I, you know, I definitely thought that this was going to be Lucy's story, you know, yes. all the way through to the end. You know, it's kind of like the Janet Lee and Psycho thing, isn't it? Where at that point, you know, forty minutes in, when Lucy kills herself again, you're just like, oh, you know, what, what, what's going to happen now? It's like that's a a really exciting thing, I think. Yeah, I think it's 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 exciting that we've been stuck in this house people have been dead for you know 20 yeah. minutes at this point where is it gonna go and so narratively it's like all bets are off you have no idea um i mean i also appreciate the honesty of that moment as sad as it makes me like it still makes me cry when she kills herself um it's just gut-wrenching but i appreciate the honesty of it because it's like survival doesn't equate to happiness yeah that's it if if you survive at all and horror movies so rarely look at the aftermath um if they do it's sort of she survived this 15 years ago but now the killer's back and then she kills the killer and everything's fine that's it like the closest we really get is something like sally hardesty in the back of that pickup truck at the end of texas chainsaw massacre yeah where she's just her mind is gone Mm -hmm. like what is her life gonna be like after this you know but we don't we don't always go into it and it's like lucy has killed everybody this should be the happy ending but it's yeah. not. It's just an ending. That's it. Yeah. It's and it, like you said, you know, surviving doesn't equal happiness, and also revenge doesn't give right. you happiness. And I know that's like that's quite an age-old kind of idea. But that is like you said. There's there are a million and one ways in which this film could have played out like a kind of you know 
Last House on the left 70s kind of way in which, you know, we spend the majority of the film watching the child suffer and then we we, we watch her grow into a human being, track uh, grow into an adult, sorry, track down these human beings that have done this to her and wreak her revenge, kills them all and that's the end of the movie, right? And it's like, that's what we're watching for is the revenge. But this film is like, nope, it's not about that at all. You know, the revenge is dealt with pretty swiftly and in a really unsatisfying way in yeah. a way, isn't it? Mm. It's really a brilliantly constructed film. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. It was so clever because then, like you say, we're at that 45 minute mark. The family are dead. Lucy's dead. <laughs> you know, it's like everything has kind of concluded. Anna is left by herself. And then we discover the basement. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> if that hammer didn't fall, things might have been okay. Oh, God. Why didn't she just leave the house, Stacey? Why didn't she just leave? <laughs> I know. That's the question. She couldn't. She couldn't. I, I think that's the that's definitely the horror fan in the audience. Like, girl, get out of the house. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. You know, but... Look at what she does while she's there. Like, I think yeah. Lucy has been the cause since the day they met. And ultimately, she feels like she failed her. And so she takes the body and she gently washes the body and she wraps it in a shroud and all. Like, she's oh. not going to abandon that body. No, no, at exactly. All. Plus, she really has, where does she have to go? This has been her cause her entire life. And now she has nothing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're you're absolutely right, and it is, and it really adds to that kind of emotional weight of the, their relationship. I think. Yeah. I think it was. It's more the moment of when she's on the phone to her mum. I'm like, hang on, why are you just stood around on the phone to your mum now? Like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that was desperation too. I mean, her mother says, "I haven't yeah. heard from you in two years." It's like this is this is how little she all she had was Lucy, and now that's gone, and she has nothing else. God. at all and then she finds the basement then so there's that yeah the, oh, the, the the absolute kind of gut-wrenching moment where she discovers this kind of hidden panel and this flight of stairs leading down into this basement and that's when that's when you're the penny drops of like oh okay this is why we've still got like an hour left of this movie yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh no! Oh, no. What's gonna happen? <laughs> and oh. and it is absolutely devastating because you you suddenly realise yeah Lucy was right she wasn't necessarily the unreliable narrator you know everything mm -hmm. she said was to be believed um, and you know so it adds kind of the the extra sort of devastation to that element and now we've got Anna venturing into this situation that again you know she's just she was just there as 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 a friend or as a as a loved one to Lucy and now she's stuck in this situation herself as well and it it feels so unfair in a way doesn't it as well? it feels really unfair and sometimes you think what is he saying like helping Lucy got her into this situation in the first place yeah. and then yeah. even when she discovered the basement she could have called the authorities or something but then she finds mm -hmm. the other woman who's still alive down there and she tries to help her so it's like okay logier you're saying that like don't help anybody it's just gonna screw you over in the end <laughs> exactly. you know and that's the thing and and at this point in the film as well it, it feels like this is where this kind of first shift occurs you know um it it kind of almost feels like it's no longer being frightening in that kind of traditional horror way so you know anna crawls down into this basement it's revealed that there is this basically torture chamber right she 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 discovers this very hostile-esque steely corridor with all these different cells when she crawls into one of the cells she finds this woman with this kind of steel helmet kind of drilled into her head mm -hmm. this woman has also been starved and abused and beaten and everything else and again you know for a moment like this which should be i think in a lot of films quite frightening there is just this overwhelming amount of sadness i think that comes with this revelation do you know what i mean yeah it's i think again it's because he deals with the aftermath of it we don't see those those devices being put on her when she's going to be screaming and everything. Mm -hmm. We see someone trying to take care of her and help her. Yeah, 
you know, and that's like you still get your horror movie sort of moments of like when they're she's when Anna's prying the staples out of her head. It's really oh. nauseating, you know. Yeah. But it's also there's a tenderness to it. Like it, this movie is so sad, my God. It's so sad. just Anna trying to bathe her and take care of her and just oh god it just this movie just knocks you out man Relentless. yeah <laughs> it does it does it's so it's so sad yeah and it really this is where that that r- real devastation you know is it really gets me at this moment with this victim and again like you know how many horror movies can you feel that way about a a random anonymous victim that we don't know anything about you know there are there are you know mm-hmm. countless of those in horror films right and we never really really care or feel for them and you know again how we manage to feel so much for this victim that we know nothing about but like you say we know you know just we we know enough we know what she's been through um or what she must have been through and uh and it's the way that anna treats her and looks after her i think as well isn't it it's yeah, yeah. i think that has a lot to do with it is at this point we know anna yeah you know and we know what kind of person she is and sort of the tenderness she shows this poor woman who never speaks a word like you said was not like we know her name or or we've been with her at all but just sort of the gentle way that she doesn't just wrap a blanket around her and that's the like okay we'll wait for the ambulance now it's like she really truly tries to to care for her the way she cared for lucy and it Mm -hmm. just even that just kind of compounds everything that ends up happening afterwards because anna is such a good person she is and i'm sure it's no it's no accident that she is like portrayed as basically a saint right i mean she's essentially right. saintly anna in a way yeah mm-hmm. um, yeah through the for her <sighs> entire life basically yeah yeah and then and then that's another moment where i go okay end of movie now yep, she saved yeah, that she time. saved that yeah, yeah she saved that woman brilliant lovely you know she's <laughs> We're friends great. now everything's fine yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Call the authorities and head home. You're they fine. They start a scholarship right. in Lucy's name and everything is great. Hooray. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, but no, no. Um, nope. She she sticks around and then this is when this group of people turn up and, you know, Anna is then captured. Um, what do you think of, uh, you know, you, you mentioned it earlier that these people that then sort of the, 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 the people that are orchestrating this, they're not portrayed as like, you know, crazy Leatherface or even the sort of people yeah. that you get in a hostile movie or whatever. There's a kind of mundane. There's a kind of mundanity to it, isn't there? In a way of how these mm-hmm. people are portrayed. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they're you know, the people at the beginning were an average family. Yeah. You know, who knows? Who knows what the children knew? Probably nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, children don't always know. I mean, how many times if I didn't know my husband was a serial killer? <laughs> yes. You know, people are often unaware. Um, but these just look like your average upper class, upper middle class white people. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's. I think that's part of the point also of what maybe this movie is trying to say is these people are so scientific and clinical and even just like the place where they're in and like, yeah, it's, it's a basement and all, but they've got the cool lighting yeah. and the weird lab where they flay Anna later. And it's just, it's very, a, sci- a detached scientific approach, despite the religious connotations of the word martyr. Yes. And it, it's always been something I've found scary in horror movies when there's not just like a single villain, but it's like a whole group, you know, it's an organization, whether it's a cult or a sect or something like this, which is, you know, it's almost business like, isn't it? It's almost corporate um, in terms of the, the money that's gone into it, the organization. Mm-hmm the systems in place the routine uh, the everydayness you know that terrifies me oh yeah oh great it's a cabal yeah like, nothing good <laughs> has come from a cabal you know <laughs> yeah. but i think that's part of the reason also why anna sticks around is mm-hmm. because this family is dead and whether they were the ones doing this to lucy or not even when she goes down into the basement and finds the chair and finds the other woman etc she thinks it's just this family yeah who could know that it's an entire network of jerks yeah 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 Yeah. and then and then this is when we're introduced isn't it to the to mademoiselle um who's who's, who's our kind of big boss baddie um mademoiselle um what do you think of her 
I, I am not uh, an advocate of what she does, but I kind of love her. You know? <laughs> I thought you might. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, just because she's pretty cool, yeah. right? Like, yeah. I have to admit. Yeah. <laughs> she looks pretty. She looks pretty awesome, doesn't she? She looks right, pretty exactly. Yeah. I love her little turban and yeah, you know, her yeah. eyewear. Um, all that. And and it's something that makes it even more chilling. I think that it. it it's still kind of she's kind of civilized. I th- there's something that's just so civilized about them all that makes it all the more scary. And when she's kind of explaining to Anna in advance, like this is what we're doing here, let me show you, and like shows her her little photo album of all of her <laughs> pre- previous scrapbook. Masters. Yeah, her scrapbook. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, of all those absolutely horrific images of people kind of on the brink of death. And I think this is where basically this is the moment where the film kind of reveals it reveals itself it reveals its hand right this yeah. is where pascal logier is telling us what this film is really about because mademoiselle says look this is what we're doing here we are kidnapping and torturing women because we believe there's this whole group of people clearly that it's a kind of philosophical secret society and they want to discover the secrets of the afterlife through the creation of martyrs so they essentially just uh, inflict systematic acts of torture upon young women in order to get these young women to achieve some kind of transcendental state, right? So that they can get a glimpse into the afterlife because Mademoiselle and this cult believe that the world is divided into two groups of people, victims who can't tolerate torture and fall into madness and martyrs who accept the pain and torture and they transcend. So essentially, these this group of people, rather than uh, discovering it themselves, they inflict torture and pain upon others and then want to find out what they've seen, right? And that this is the moment where we get that explanation. Mm-hmm. It's it's terrifying in how businesslike and serious it is. Yes. She's showing Anna, you know, her scrapbook uh, <laughs> and describing it all to her, but that's it. Then she closes the book and she's like, this is how it is. This is what we do. Good, and walks off without a word. And that's the end. And because Anna isn't I love that she's quiet through this. Mm-hmm. She's not screaming and yelling and saying, who are you people? What are you doing? Like, she's not playing the typical horror movie victim. Yeah. It just, to me, that just makes it so much more horrifying because yeah. then they just pick her up and take her in the room and this is it. You're done. And this is it. Yeah. That's that horrifying kind of moment. I mean, is it, I guess we already kind of knew at this point that Anna was in for it too, but especially there's the moment when Mademoiselle kind of says, women particularly kind of young women are very susceptible to this you know to this thing Mm -hmm. to this martyrdom and everything and kind of looks at Anna and and that's when you know it's like oh she's next basically this is now going to happen to her um it's just again devastating because at this moment you you know I remember just glancing at the running time being like oh god this is it now isn't it this is like the (laughs) next 45 minutes of the film (laughs) Yeah, and yet as a horror fan, the first time you see this, you're still like, she's gonna get out. Yes, she'll get out. She'll something will happen, and she too will escape, and mm-hmm. that'll be. And then these people will finally get what's coming to them. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no, no. So then, um, yeah, I mean, I don't even know how to describe the next sort of series of scenes. I mean, you mentioned this at the very beginning of our chat. This is the mo- this is the stuff. I think this is the stuff that gives the film the reputation that it has, isn't it? It's the it's the this series of tiny little tiny little snippets little set pieces of 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 Anna being tortured day by day and like you say it just kind of fades to black and then fades back in and it's like now it's the next day and now it's the next day and um this is for me the worst kind of torture it's not snipping out eyeballs or cutting Achilles tendons like in a hostel this is force feeding and punching and again there's just something quite mundane and real about it isn't there I think yeah, it's just, it's the nine to five job of the people who live upstairs. Oh, yeah. There's no appealing to them. They're fa- they're faceless. He doesn't show us their faces mm-hmm. while they're doing this to her, um, which is something that I love. It doesn't lessen the impact. If anything, it's, I think it's more impactful, but we don't get close-ups of like, you know, what they're doing to her. It's like often 
she'll be completely obscured and the sound is enough. And then when it fades back in the next day and you see Anna's face and it's just unrecognizable because it's so bruised and swollen. Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You're, it's very, it's really interesting. The choices that Logier makes visually, like there are moments where we we're, we're sort of behind Anna and we're at her eye level, aren't we? So that when the torturer is stood punching her we he's kind of cut off at the neck like we deliberately don't right. see his face right um we just see his hands and what he's doing to her from behind um and yeah like you say it's it's not really focusing on the the blood and gore and the you know all that stuff it's uh it's just the pain i suppose isn't it yeah i this whole second half of the movie for all of the crazy violence in the first half the second half where she's getting tortured is basically bloodless yeah even after they flay her you know, we don't get the dripping blood and we see the aftermath of it. And there are these little moments that j- of emotional impact. Like the, the man who does the most, who beats her up, has at least a foot on her and probably 100 pounds easy. And there's just the desperate moment where she hits him and she tries to fight back, mm-hmm. you know, while she's in chains. Like moments like that or where the woman is force feeding her and she grabs her hand, mm-hmm. you know, and it just really humanizes her and we don't need her to be sitting there screaming and crying yeah for an emotional impact and another really kind of chilling moment in a a way is where you do suddenly get a little glimpse of the behind the scenes of the torturers right there's that moment when the torturers kind of walk back upstairs and take off their gloves and they have a little chat and again it's like they're not really enjoying it either are they and they are kind of in a weird way kind of rooting for anna like they want her to 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 do what they want her to do right they want her to to transcend or whatever um and right. it doesn't seem like they want to be doing what they're doing you know right i mean it's it's always it's a real moment of it's a kind of a shocking moment to me when yeah we follow them upstairs and the woman is making the gruel in the blender mm-hmm. yeah and you know because they are so faceless in all of this and you're like she's just making this stuff in a blender yeah. Like the banality of evil, you yeah. know? And then yeah. he, he takes a shower and, oh, he has a little scratch on his neck, you know? <laughs> it's just, it's it's awful. But, I mean, if Anna transcends, it means they're doing a good job, right? Like, yeah, that's this is it. literally their job. And so. uh, and this is, uh, th- there's a really tricky thing with films like this, I think, um, as to... You know, I think all of us horror fans, people really fall over themselves to say martyrs is better than your average torture porn movie because it's about something and i I kind of agree with that to an extent but just to play devil's advocate on this as well is this i mean is this not a film that is just relishing in the torture and brutality towards women i mean clearly the story itself is about torture and about what inflicting torture what the consequences of that are right what the results of that are for both the person being tortured and the torturer and the people witnessing it but it is also a film where the entire last act is just watching a woman be beaten and force-fed and brutalized and skinned and everything else and i don't know sometimes i think oh is this film really as clever as everyone says it is especially when i see some of pascal logier's other films like Incident in a Ghostland and I just think actually is this guy just really into making films about women being brutalized you know right um it's something I've kind of wrestled with in terms of this movie and his other movies is that especially knowing the stories behind these films that he's not good he's not good to his actresses um I think he is so kind of solipsistic and sort of up his own ass in terms of like his own depression or whatever that right. I think he d- doesn't even really, I don't know if he enjoys the violence against women. I think it's almost not a consideration, yeah. which is almost worse. Yeah. It's like these actresses on every movie have been injured to some degree. Yeah. You know, Morjana Aloui spent a month in bed um, because she broke a leg or something because the set wasn't stabilized the way it should have been. Oh God. Um, so I think it's just he makes these movies and other people suffer for them and hopefully there's a point to it maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and and I think, you know, I guess it's that it's that thing, isn't it, that you know, I'm sure we've all talked about before is this, you know, the director's intentions 
are they even yes. important ultimately you know it's it's what we get out of a, of a movie isn't it really and and it's how we see what he's giving us i guess ultimately um and separating yeah. the, the art from the artist and all the other stuff that like it feels like more and more these days we have to kind of discuss and confront it's it's something you have to wrestle with with like every movie yeah. <laughs> right yeah. especially the older stuff like if you kind of reassess something you haven't seen in 20 years yeah um when things have come out and it's like i think everybody's got their line and their limit of what they will watch and what they won't watch um you know, it's something like even high tension. It's like, mm. I'm not sure what the director intended, but this is what I get out of it. Yeah, because sort of there's a lot of people that really take against that movie, right? Particularly the ending right. and, and what's revealed. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, totally. And, you know, I think it, r- regardless of all that, undeniably, like we keep saying, this movie is devastating. And I think a movie that treats violence as devastating as this movie does... I guess really means that it's its heart is kind of in the right place, right? I mean, I think you react to violence in this film how a how a healthy human being should react to violence, I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's I think it's a fine line to like make a movie about violence against women without yes. it just being a movie that is violence against women. Yeah. You know, but I think it's not about the violence itself, which I think is the difference. I think it's about what we do and mm-hmm the aftermath and the effects that that can have you know yeah like lucy's entire life her entire life is being tortured basically yeah psychologically yeah um and yeah. we didn't need to see her as a child beaten and all these other things that happened to her you know mm. it's that chilling line as well that the mademoiselle says where she says you know oh creating victims is easy you know anybody and, and they, they say oh lucy was a victim you know you can create victims but you know creating a martyr is something else and it's it's yeah it's uh it's that realization again of how cleverly this film is structured because the first half of the film tells the story of a victim uh, lucy and the second half tells the story of a martyr right um anna but yeah just that 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 explanation coming from mademoiselle and her dismissing you know what lucy has gone through is like oh that's a victim you know we do that all the time they're easy to make you know it's like oh it's just it's really chilling yeah and then you're like, uh, you know, all right, Mademoiselle has a cool aesthetic, but she's a big jerk, okay? <laughs> she's a jerk as well. I just want to establish that, all right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's not okay. I mean, she's not okay. Um, and uh, <laughs> So then we get to the end of that, what seems to go on forever, you know, series of, of, um, of moments of torture. And uh, this is another moment where I go, okay, I'd like to turn it off here, where uh, the torturer goes, okay, you're nearly done. You, you, you know, you've done so well. Um, your pain is nearly over we've got one last thing to to put you through and then that's it and it's like okay phew you know uh, this is it now is it this is where she's going to escape or whatever and uh, yeah uh, yeah oh god and then they- no and then the lights go on in the laboratory <sighs> And then it somehow manages to go to a place that you never could have anticipated. No, no. Every time you think you've seen the worst thing this film can give you, it somehow gets worse. It somehow gets more yeah. traumatic. Um, and they strap her up to this big metal rack thing. And um, and then they start to remove her skin. They flay her alive, right? Oh. And, and of, we, of course, we don't we don't really see it. We hear it as they start to skin her and then we cut away and we don't actually see it. So again, it's kind of relatively restrained on the gore side, isn't it? Right. Again, like dealing with the aftermath. We don't see like peeling off strips of flesh and all mm-hmm. that. It Once you see like, okay, they're going to start cutting her. I'm not sure what they're going to do. Yeah. But he switches to a close up of Anna's face. Yeah. So we see how she is impacted by what's going on. Mm-hmm. We don't get to go, oh, look at that special effect where they peeled off all her skin. Yeah. Yeah, and then we see what they did to her, and it's like, oh my god! Oh my god! Yeah, that <laughs> this angel, she does not like. Ah, oh, I mean, none of these women deserved this, but my god! <sighs> I know, but uh, yeah, that's so. Yeah, no, no, nobody, and that's the thing. You, you, you feel such an overwhelming amount of empathy for all of and sympathy for all of these characters that you're like, I've got no, I'm, but I'm, I've run, I'm all out of sympathy almost. Like, what more can I, what more can I suffer yeah. for for these characters <laughs> by this point? You know, it's just again. And it's just absolutely devastating. And again, this is the moment when you're like, okay, 
maybe she's not going to be okay, right? I mean, that's it really for her, right. isn't yeah. it? I mean, the next time you see her when she essentially has no skin, it's like, well, that's yeah. that's that's it. Um, How she's going to get out of this one? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then, of course, we have this crazy moment where we start to see what she's seeing, right? There is this kind of, the camera sort of zooms into her eye and we see this incredible bright white light and suddenly we're having something that, you know, resembles some sort of transcendent mm-hmm. religious experience, right? It gets cosmic. And it gets that's cosmic. When, and that's when everybody, you know, the audience is like, oh, what's she seeing? What is she seeing? What does she say? What's it all about? And I think it's so frustrating that we don't know, but I think that also is part of the point of this whole thing, is that these this cabal, this evil cabal, has the financial means um, to, uh, you know, simply exist in a thirst for knowledge and a, and a determination to find out what happens when we die. Yeah. Like, that's their privilege. And they have these women doing the actual work and the actual suffering and they want all the answers you know yeah it it reminds me there's a kate bush song i don't know if you know kate bush Mm -hmm. but um that song sat in your lap where she wants she wants all the knowledge but she doesn't want to do any of the work (laughs) yes just give me and that's what this all is and i think the fact that we're the witnesses we're the martyrs it's like we don't get to have that knowledge either Yes. It's like, we don't get to have, we're not privileged enough. What work did we do? Like, yeah, sitting through this movie is work. (laughs) And, you know, Anna's the one who paid the price. Why do we just get to sit here and be told all of the answers to all the mysteries of life? Yeah, exactly that. And it does, and it it kind of goes back to that thing that, you know, a lot of horror, great horror movies have, which is making us reckon with ourselves at why we like watching this stuff, right, as well. Like, why we choose to pop on a film like Martyrs, you know. And uh, and that, I think that's all part of it too, in a way, isn't it? Like, we, like you say, we've watched all this suffering and we're not... And ultimately, we're going to get nothing out of it by the end, you know. Like, right. And that was it, you yeah. know. Yeah. Because that's, that's one of the cruel vagaries of life is that, it, you know, especially when you have like a depressed filmmaker who's saying life is nothing but suffering and there's no point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, but I think, I think when Mademoiselle says keep doubting, mm-hmm. to me, it's because all we have as human beings is our thirst for knowledge. All we have is the wondering and the doubting. The answer will come to all of us when we die. Yeah. And, but not before then we're not, we're not allowed that information. And so just keep, keep doing the work and keep trying and keep thinking because that's all we have as humans yeah. really yeah exactly i mean i mean as long as the work isn't this kind of work like mademoiselle <laughs> <work. laughs> yeah yeah well you know when you said like um that as audience members we end up having that why am i watching this mm. it was sort of that, that was the feeling i had after i saw funny games the Michael yes Monica movie. yes you have that same like, okay, what is my relationship with the genre? Why do I like this? And I think those are really healthy questions mm-hmm. to ask. Yeah. Um, but I think t- to me, the difference is that I don't think Logier has contempt for his audience. No, that's the, di- yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think Michael Haneke just made me feel like a piece of shit for enjoying horror movies. Yeah. My- Michael, ha- yeah, Michael Haneke <laughs> is going, ha ha ha, fuck you, basically throughout yeah. that entire movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I do like to, you know, I I reassess every once in a while. You know, what do I what do I like? And my tastes have changed, like we talked early on, mm-hmm. like since the beginning, since my early days as a viewer, since the early days of Final Girl. Um, I'm constantly questioning my relationship with the genre, and I think that's good. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And there's um, there's nothing that will make you question everything quite as much as this as this yeah. and <laughs> yeah. uh, and this ending, right? As well. And then, of course, like you say, we get this moment when. Um, when Annie, when Anna whispers in Mademoiselle's oh, ear, um, and and then of course the next thing we see is Mademoiselle shoot herself, um, and we'll never know, of course. But do you have any theories? Do you have any thoughts on what Anna whispered to the Mademoiselle at that moment? It can go so many different ways. Yeah. I think there's so many options. I think whatever she tells her, I think it's the truth. Yes. I don't I don't think she's lying to try to pull one over on these people. I don't think that's who she is. So mm-hmm. I think it's the truth. 
Um, it could be, uh, <laughs> I don't know how definitive it is, but I think about when did Anna transcend? Like, uh-huh. what was she going through when she finally crossed over? And it's like she was experiencing maybe the only instances of beauty and love in this movie, which is where, you know, the Mademoiselle has said, oh, when we create these victims and they get tortured, they end up hallucinating and seeing things that aren't there. Yeah. Lucy saw the woman she couldn't save. The other woman had cockroaches all over her body, etc. Yeah. Anna yeah. sees Lucy. Yeah. And it's Lucy's words saying, like, you're not afraid anymore. It's like, finally, Lucy is taking care of her. Mm-hmm. And that's when the woman comes in and she's transcended, basically. So I think that kind of thing runs completely counter to everything this cabal is doing with their emotionless detachment, treating people that are expendable. Yeah. When they die, they just throw them in a pit and bury them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so I, I, to me, the most satisfying is like all of your work has been in vain. Yes. Yeah. I think that must be that must be what it is, right? I think, you know, because you'd think like if she said, oh, I saw nothing, I don't know whether right. the mademoiselle would necessarily kill herself. Maybe she would just be like, right, well, we've just got to keep going, right? We've just got to keep torturing more people until we find out kind of thing. And then. Um, right. But so like you say, it's probably it's got to be the truth and it's got to be something, um, just something that maybe she's never, ever going to be privy to or that something that she's never been able to uh that, that, that her work hasn't really, you know, done anything towards creating or something. I don't know. But yeah. Yeah. The work they've done is kind of precluding them maybe yes. from this. Because then also the mood, the film ends with Anna kind of in this catatonic state. We see her staring into space. And then when it cuts to the credits, we get footage of her and Lucy as children together mm-hmm. having a good time. Yeah. And so it's, is that what Anna is seeing? Yeah. It's like reliving the moments of happiness that she had with the person she loves the most in the world. And here we have these, you know, wealthy Nazis basically conducting experiments on people and they're just going to be denied any of that happiness. Yeah. Maybe. And, and, and in that regard, it's almost, it almost tricks you into feeling like it's a kind of uplifting ending, like a, right. or, a, or a slightly more positive ending for Anna ultimately, because because of what happens to the end for Mademoiselle in comparison to what happened for Anna. And that's some crazy profound shit that you can actually come out of that thinking that there was some kind of light at the end of that for her, you know? It's shocking that he would allow us, <laughs> that Logier would allow us yeah. that. But I mean, to me, that's, you know, she's not going to get up and like wrap a towel around herself and grab a machine gun. No. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> This is the closest thing we're going to get to any kind of a a good, a decent ending. Yeah. And maybe it's just, you know, be good to each other. It's as like corny as that is and as simple as that is. Yeah. You know? Be more, be more Anna, basically. Be more, don't be a mademoiselle. <laughs> no matter how right? cool she looks, you know, don't be a mademoiselle. Turban or no, do not be a mademoiselle. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, what a devastating movie and I think it's really clever and I, I don't think I really took notice of this the first time I watched it but the way in which the, the film itself the form the tone the structure of the film changes it, and it mirrors what these characters go through right it mirrors what the point of this film is so the first act as we talked about is pure undiluted horror it is pure hardcore horror jump scares gore nastiness shock the lot then we move into a sense of melancholy of sadness of absolute devastation in the middle section of the film and then finally a a sense of peace and a kind of transcendence right yeah i think our journey sort of reflects hers to a point Uh uh-huh yeah. Where, you know, she she is there for Lucy and believes her, but she has no idea what actually happened, mm. you know, through the first 45 minutes of the movie. And that's kind of where we are. And then we're in it with her. And then we almost become like the cultists, basically. Like, we want the answer. Like, tell us. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Give us an answer, woman. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so it's just this movie cannot be predicted, which I think is 
that's such a rare thing to say about a horror movie is mm. that there's nothing predictable about it yeah and how special is that like how incredible is that really Um, and nothing is really nothing yeah i mean i mean i know it got a crappy remake didn't it but but other than that you know nothing is really kind of attempted to do what martyrs did you know yeah i think i haven't been able to bring myself to watch the remake oh it's better but i've read i've read the synopsis Yeah, yeah it's it's, and I think that does have a bit more of a rah-rah. Oh, it does. It, it's exactly what you'd imagine an American remake of <laughs> Martyrs to be. Yeah. God! <laughs> oh, my Lord. Um, well, before we wrap up, we are now going to head over to our new regular segment, Wild About Horror. Let's hear what Freudian cinephile Mary Wilde has to say about Pascal Logier's Martyrs. Hey Mike, Mary Wild here wishing you and all your listeners a very happy new year. Since you're covering Pascal Logier's harrowing masterpiece Martyrs today, I thought I'd throw in my two cents worth. There's certainly no shortage of psychological significance in this film, a disturbing and oddly beguiling watch in equal measure. Horror connoisseurs are, of course, familiar with the storyline, A philosophical society attempts to discover the secrets of the afterlife through the creation of martyrs, a term deriving from the Greek, meaning witness. Their experiments inflict brutal acts of torture upon young women in the belief that their pain will result in insight about the realm beyond death. Their leader, Mademoiselle, believes that there are two types of people in the world— Victims, those who can't sustain suffering and descend into madness, and martyrs, the rare few capable of accepting the terrible pain, sacrificing themselves and transcending into a new consciousness. The desired state is one of transfiguration, survival of complete deprivation, a total change of form into a more beautiful and spiritual condition, And according to the society's findings, women are more responsive to transfiguration. Go figure. In the film, the group targets Anna as a new experimental subject. After a protracted period of daily beatings and abject degradation, Anna eventually reaches what is referred to as the final stage. She is flayed alive and survives the procedure, entering a trance-like euphoric state and is apparently communicative, reporting back on her vision to Mademoiselle, who eagerly listens to what Anna has to say. Members of the society gather to learn of the insights Anna shared. Mademoiselle's assistant asks if what Anna said to her was clear. Mademoiselle replies that it was, and asks him in turn if he can imagine what comes after death. When he says no, Mademoiselle instructs him to keep doubting then abruptly produces a handgun from her bag and kills herself. There is a lot of speculation on the internet about the reason why Mademoiselle shot herself. Anna's message is kept secret from the audience, so we are left wondering what exactly she saw during Transfiguration. Did Anna say something that renders the experiment null and void, leaving Mademoiselle too mortified and ashamed to face her fellow society members, so she chose instead to commit suicide? Or was Anna's revelation about the spirit world so magnificent that Mademoiselle couldn't wait a second longer and embrace death to gain access to that glorious place immediately? This question has always bugged me. That final line, keep doubting, is fascinating. But what does it mean? A theoretical construct that helped me navigate the mystery of martyrs is psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan's notion of the real. Let's suppose that our understanding of the world, the way we order things, all of it is rooted in a system of language. Everything we can imagine, we assign meaning to it in a symbolic order. And that's how we come to know the world we live in. Well, the real is an undifferentiated realm. It resists symbolization. It's a sphere wholly outside language. The real is impossible to imagine, impossible to integrate in our system of knowledge, impossible to attain in any way. 
The difficulty in translating the experience of the real and our failure to communicate what it is gives it an essentially traumatic quality. Natural disasters are a good approximation of the real because they break down the routine of everyday life and introduce an alien dimension that is stunning and paralyzing when we try to come to terms with it. An earthquake, for example, ruptures the familiar, reassuring quality of home life and introduces an unrecognizable element into what is supposed to be a reassuring space. In the aftermath of a confrontation with the real, our network of meaning is severely disrupted and it feels like we are crumbling into ruins with it. We are left without the usual ability of relying on language to articulate meaning. We no longer know how to proceed and therein lies the unspeakable trauma of the real. In my opinion, that which Anna bore witness to following the final phase of torture can be conceptualized as something close to the real, something that casts uncertainty over the stability we've worked hard to achieve, dismantling what we thought we knew, making a mess out of everything, and it becomes too much to bear. Anna's message is that over which Mademoiselle's worldview stumbles, that which is lacking in the philosophical society's grounding conscious beliefs the non-removable residue of all articulation. The devastating trauma of facing the real is a plausible explanation for why Mademoiselle felt compelled to shoot herself, especially at such a crucial moment when the society had gathered only a few feet away, bursting with anticipation to hear what the martyr Anna had to say. What's interesting is that Mademoiselle takes the time to carefully remove her makeup and slowly peels off her false eyelashes before reaching for her gun. I view this unmasking routine as an attempt to eliminate the facade and expunge her persona as leader of the torture cult. Because in relation to the sublime power of the real, these flimsy symbolic embellishments quickly dissolve into nothingness. I think that the COVID pandemic is also a good approximation of the Lacanian real, because it forced us in 2020 to see how our coping systems can so easily become disturbed. And naturally, the traumatic dimension of this realization is inescapable. But rather than give up and give in like Mademoiselle, I hope we are all able to overcome the disruption to our lives and continue to find meaning wherever we can, becoming ever more inventive, creative, and analytical, even as we face the unspeakable. A happy and courageous new year, everyone. Catch you on the next episode. A big thank you there to the amazing Mary Wilde. Uh, don't forget, if you want to find more of Mary's takes on genre movies, you can listen to her podcast, The Projections Podcast, which she co-hosts with Sarah Cleaver. And you can also uh, find information about upcoming courses that Mary's going to be running online. Uh, just follow her at Psychstar on Twitter. Okay, Stacey, we're going to wrap up Martyrs shortly. Let me ask you, I mean, it's been, what, 10, 12 years since the film. Um, how do you think it holds up, you know, all these years later? Uh, is the film still as powerful, as devastating as it was in 2008? And would you still recommend Martyrs to horror fans that haven't seen it? Yes, to all of it, I think. It's still, uh, you know, I've seen it a lot, um, and it's still... Is de as devastating as yeah. day one. Yeah. Um, sometimes at different moment, different moments will hit harder than others, yeah. depending. Um, I still think it's there's nothing like it. There's been nothing like it since then, and it doesn't feel dated. What's really interesting about this movie to me, which is really kind of inconsequential, I haven't dug into why, but this is a period film. That's right. It's like set in the eighties or something. Period. Yeah, the early 80s. The date on the newspaper clipping that triggers Lucy is 1983. That is very strange, isn't it? Because there's no... It doesn't feel like there's any particular narrative reason for why it would need to be period set. Yeah, I don't know if that's just a big elaborate way so he doesn't have to deal with cell phones. Yeah, yeah, uh, which is, you know, often the way, I think, isn't it, with a lot of horror films right now, is that it's like, quick, just stick it in the 80s, then we don't have to worry right. about it. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, then we don't have to worry. Or I don't know if it has anything to do with like satanic panic era. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I don't know what that was like in Europe. You know, I know about it here, but I don't know if it was a worldwide kind of phenomenon or not. Yeah, and 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 also, also um, again, I'm not sure specifically about France, but it was it was it was quite a, a decade of conservatism, wasn't it, with with Reagan and mm-hmm. Margaret Thatcher and and this idea of greed and you know consumerism and everything else. I don't I don't know whether any of that is is playing into this in any way, but. Um... Yes. Well, I mean, that to me, you know, the, I mean, granted, I'm a staunch anti capitalist, but, you know, <laughs> I think that that is a major theme. I mentioned it early on. Of yeah. Like, you know, you, you have these two misfits doing the work of the wealthy, and it's all society, like rampant capitalism renders some people as less than. Yes. You know, and I think he shows us the repercussions of that. So, so maybe, yeah, the Thatcher era. Yeah. Of, there you go. Ugh. My God, it's a big, it's a meaty movie. As that's that's why I love it so much. It's, yeah. I'm not like, oh, I love the part where he punches her in the face. You know, it's not like that. <laughs> there's just endless questions and so much to engage with in this movie. That's it. That is it. Um, well, Stacy, thank you so much for this. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been it's been an absolute pleasure. Which, considering the film, you know, is re- is quite something. <laughs> right. I love talking about this movie. I just I, I you know I could talk about this movie anytime. So this was a big pleasure to really kind of dive into it. Amazing. Sure. Well, just remind us again um, for anyone out there who wants to kind of track down more of your work, your blog, your podcast. Where can they sort of find all of that stuff out there? Um, there are links to everything uh, if you go to gaylordsofdarkness.com which is the podcast website that's got links to all my other stuff or final girl dot rocks. I guess those are the two big places. Um, I'm writing for Rue Morgue. You can find me in the pages of Rue Morgue magazine. Very cool. Um, just kind of everywhere, you know, just all over the place. I'm like, like a Baba Duke. You never know when I'm going to show up in my top hat. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And final question for you, Stacey. I ask all my new guests, what's your favorite horror movie? <gasps> How dare you? Um, I know. <laughs> boy, I mean, right now I'd have to say Suspiria 2018. Oh, I, I love how much you guys love Suspiria 2018. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. I love it. It kills me that it just was such a big flop. It's such an injustice. <laughs> but yeah. I, I, think that, I think overall that's my favorite. It's so <laughs> brilliant. You had what? About four episodes of your podcast dedicated <laughs> to that movie? <laughs> Yeah, there's always something to talk about. So. <laughs> I love it. Well, yeah. Stacey, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening and a huge thank you to my two brilliant guests. There were no two better people uh, to discuss martyrs with than Alex West and Stacey Ponder. Don't forget, if you want to hear more from Stacey Ponder, subscribe to her podcast. Uh, It's really wonderful. It's super smart, but it's also hilariously funny. She co-hosts it with Anthony Hudson. It's called Gay Lords of Darkness. You can find that wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, Alex West is co-host of the Faculty of Horror podcast. And again, you can find that anywhere um so i'd love to hear from you guys what do you think of martyrs is it as extreme as the hype suggests do you think it's a bit overrated send in your thoughts you can email us evolution of horror at gmail.com you can also find us on twitter letterboxd and instagram and facebook you can join the discussion group the evolution of horror discussion group in which you can discuss horror films and anything else you like with fellow listeners you can also support us financially on patreon for weekly bonus content. There you can subscribe at a $5, $10 or $20 level and get different benefits accordingly. This month we are about to kick off our mini season on Alfred Hitchcock. So we're going to be covering all of Hitchcock's major movies over the next few months. You can get that if you are a $10 or upwards donor. Head on over to patreon.com slash evolution of horror. You can find this podcast on all major podcast platforms including iTunes, Podbean, 
Stitcher, Acast, Libsyn and Spotify. Please do subscribe to us. Please do spread the word about us. Tweet about us if you get a minute. Tell your friends and family about us. Every extra subscriber helps. And if you get a spare minute, we would hugely appreciate a review and a rating on Apple Podcasts, preferably a positive one. Uh, That will also really help us get discovered by new listeners. Okay then, onwards to next week as we continue our journey through the 2000s in the Mind and Body series. Next week is going to be a movie that we've touched upon quite a lot this week actually. While all of this crazy stuff was going on in France, there was some other pretty extreme stuff happening over in the US. Next week, I'm going to be joined by friend of the pod Adam Robinson, and we are going to be discussing two two movies. <clears throat> two movies by director Eli Roth. <sighs> Cabin Fever from 2003 and Hostel from 2005. Can't wait. Join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror. Horror.